I'm Gareth, this is What Culture Star Wars, and here is everything you somehow missed in every Star Wars movie. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, or just Star Wars or whatever you want to call it. Number 20, Stormtroopers were largely left-handed. If you look closely at the Empire's soldiers, and the way they hold their anything but effective weapons, you'll spot that the majority of Stormtroopers are actually left-handed in A New Hope. Far from there randomly just being a lot more left-handed folks walking around in this particular galaxy far, far away though, this was likely brought on by the fact that the E-11 weapons used in the original trilogy by the troopers are based on the real 1950s submachine gun known as the Sterling Mark IV L2A3. This weapon had its magazine clip on the left, meaning that it would repeatedly bang into the chest of right-handed stormtroopers. So those tasked with playing the hopeless soldiers seemingly just decided to switch up the way they were holding the weapon and make their lives that little bit easier on set. Number 19, Obi-Wan doesn't actually say an iconic line in this movie. Of the many instantly iconic phrases that have popped up in the galaxy far, far away over the years, few will ever really be able to top the simple but effective parting salute of may the force be with you. And one person who has very much become synonymous with that legendary message is the first ever space wizard to pop up on the big screen in the form of Obi-Wan Kenobi. In reality though, the Jedi also known as Ben didn't actually ever utter that immortal line at any point in A New Hope. While Luke Skywalker's master did unleash a few similar versions of this statement in the form of the force will be with you always and use the force Luke. The first use of the most famous version of the quote originally came from General Dodonna before the attack on the Death Star. Obi-Wan would at least go on to say it in the prequels though, so you know, that's something. Number 18, 2 billion folks died during the runtime. According to List of Deaths Wiki, a grand total of 2,001,549,311 folks bite the dust over the course of episode 4, with 1.5 million of those actually being Imperial crew members who were on board the Planet Killer during the moment Luke Skywalker blasted it with one hell of a reactor core shot. And while Skywalker may have ultimately been responsible for a chilling 1,549,232 deaths during the film as a whole, Grand Moff Tarkin still held the unwanted honor of most on-screen kills by some margin, with 2 billion and 10 being murdered thanks to his destroying of Alderaan early on. Number 17, Alderaan's planetary shield didn't do much to stop the Death Star. If you slow down the shot just as the Death Star's super laser reaches the innocent core world of Alderaan, you can spot that the planet actually seemed to possess a planetary shield of sorts that was ultimately overwhelmed by the sheer power of the super weapon. And while it was actually only confirmed in Legends that Alderaan boasted these defenses, and hasn't officially been made a part of canon at time of recording, it would make sense for certain planets to utilize such defenses at a time when the Death Star was starting to make its presence known in the galaxy. Others have argued that this could have simply been the atmosphere igniting upon the laser's impact with it. But either way, the heartbreaking end result was still the same. Number 16, Darth Vader only has 8 minutes of screen time. How much screen time does being the biggest bad in the galaxy buy you? About 8 minutes apparently. That's according to the folks over at Hours. With that site figuring out that Darth Vader actually only appears on our screens over the course of A New Hope for around 6% of the entire runtime. The fact he'd then go on to become arguably the most famous big screen antagonist of all time in the wake of such a pitiful amount of overall minutes in front of the camera tells you all you need to know about how impactful the masked icon actually was. Number 15, a specific Tusken Raider beat was actually looped. Long before they were finally being humanized as a people on the likes of the Book of Boba Fett, the Tusken Raiders were primarily known as the aliens who ambushed Luke Skywalker pretty early on in A New Hope. And it's during that first real showing from the Tatooine natives that a cheeky little editing trick plays out under most fans' unaware noses. Keep an eye on the moment one of the Tuscans waves their stick in the air in the wake of surprising Skywalker amongst the rocks. And you'll spot that the person behind the brilliant costume only waved their Gadurfi stick on one occasion. Peter Diamond's solitary move as the raider was then repeated and reversed a few times in order to create the illusion of him shaking the weapon around a bit to intimidate the spooked farm boy. Number 14, the Bantha was played by an Asian elephant. While you may have often found yourself wondering precisely how the likes of George Lucas and co were able to convincingly conjure up an alien creature that looks like something you could very much attach a saddle to in real life, the truth is that this particular Bantha actually kinda was. In reality, the horned gentle giants were brought to life by none other than an Asian elephant by the name of Margie. And while the gorgeous girl was able to get through her required shots in the end, she understandably wasn't the biggest fan of the heat in Death Valley. So 
the poor trained elephant actually routinely found herself trying to get the annoying fur and horns off her body midway through scenes. You can't exactly blame her, can you? Number 13, IG unit heads are used as dispensers in the cantina. If you needed a visual reminder of just how unwelcome droids were inside of Moss Eisley's legendary cantina for a time, then look no further than the dispensers found occupying the bar. Wondering why those containers look a little familiar? Well, that's because they're actually the heads of IG series droids, similar to the one found helping Din Djarin and Grogu escape the Empire on Navarro in The Mandalorian. That droid head is actually little more than a Rolls-Royce Derwent jet engine in reality, and was technically debuted in A New Hope as a dispenser a few years before IG-88 first arrived on the scene as a bounty hunter in The Empire Strikes Back. Number 12, Mark Hamill's helmet words weren't in the script, but his line was still left in anyway. The young cast tasked with being the faces of Star Wars for generations to come weren't exactly the biggest fans of sticking to George Lucas's often questionable script. And one particular instance of a certain actor cheekily finding a way to sneak some of their own work into the finished article involved none other than Mark Hamill and a helmet. While many assumed that the Luke Skywalker actor wasn't aware the camera was rolling during the moment involving the Jedi in training donning a Stormtrooper outfit as a disguise on the Death Star, his line of I can't see a thing in this helmet was very much done with the knowledge that he was being filmed, according to Hamill himself. The youngster thought it simply didn't matter what he said because no one could see his face, and he couldn't see anything out of the helmet either. But everyone on set actually liked the unexpected line, and so Lucas allowed him to keep it in for the takes that followed. Number 11, it's the only Star Wars movie not boasting an iconic theme. On top of barely showing up in the film, it turns out that Darth Vader was also without his iconic theme tune throughout the first ever Star Wars flick too. How rude. And not only was Vader's debut in Pyramid March 3, it turns out that Episode 4 actually sits as the only Star Wars movie to not once throw out even a version of the iconic theme at any point in the tale. It was only debuted in The Empire Strikes Back, and quickly went on to become one of the most recognisable bangers the galaxy has ever known. Number 10, the origins of certain alien languages. Away from the human stars of the show, George Lucas's first adventure in the galaxy far, far away also brought with it a whole host of distinct alien species that fans would ultimately get to know rather well over the decades. In order to create the unique voices and languages of a number of these brand new alien creations, the minds behind A New Hope decided to use some real-life inspiration in a number of cases. When it comes to the Jawas found scavenging on Tatooine, it turns out that the language you hear them speaking is based on the African language of Zulu, with sound designer Ben Burt speeding up the dialogue spoken by the actors in post-production. Elsewhere, the person who may or may not have shot Han Solo first on Mos Eisley by the name of Greedo was speaking the language of Quechua, a native language of South America. Number 9, a mirror helped achieve those speeder wide shots. With this picture being forged long before CGI was at a level where you could realistically blast a speeder across a desert for a convincing wide shot, it took a little bit of good old movie magic to capture Luke Skywalker whizzing across Tatooine in his chosen mode of transport. In the end, a mirror was actually attached to the side of the speeder, which was moving across the sand on wheels. This reflected the terrain around it and gave off the illusion of the vehicle hovering across the desert. And just to really protect the illusion he was creating on screen, Lucas also whacked some Vaseline on a camera lens filter to ever so slightly blur the base of the vehicle, a method that was ultimately nicknamed the force field by crew members. Number 8, Mark Hamill burst a blood vessel and had to be shot from one side. With Hamill's Jedi in training having battled against a dire Noga in the lead up to the walls beginning to close in on our heroes in their trash compactor, the actor felt that he needed to achieve a strangulated look for the scene, so he purposefully made his face go bright red and burst a blood vessel in his eye in the process. In the wake of this embarrassing moment, the crew were forced to carefully shoot around the injury until it healed. And the worst part? Lucas would ultimately confess that, with the lighting and red filters being used in this moment, his efforts wouldn't have even been noticed in the first place. This is why it's always best to have a quick chat with your director before attempting something rather silly, isn't it? Number 7, a familiar looking skeleton. While the galaxy far, far away was eventually shown to be one that was overflowing with life and exciting new alien species to discover, one of the first real alien beings fans were introduced to was none other than a crate dragon. Or at least what was a crate dragon? This particular skeleton on Tatooine belonged to a greater crate dragon. And far from this being the last time one of these giant Tatooine beasties was unleashed on camera, another one of this particular kind of crate dragon would actually pop up in the Mandalorian later down the road too. Attacking the villagers of Mos Pelgo and some Tusken Raiders during season two, Mando and Cobb 
Banth ultimately join forces to take down the intimidating space dragon. And locals on Tatooine also believe that none other than Obi-Wan Kenobi took out a flying crate dragon some time after the Great Jedi Purge as well. Number 6. Harrison Ford made up his intercom lines Harrison Ford once famously noted to his director, George, you can type this sh but you can't say it. And with that in mind, Ford was said to have apparently not bothered with even attempting to learn his lines for the moment he tries to convince some Imperial forces that everything's perfectly alright now over an intercom. Instead, the Han Solo actor felt that improvising this bumbling moment was the better way to go. Boring conversation anyway is right up there with the very best one-liners to follow a blaster shot in movie history. And it seemingly came straight from the star behind the galaxy's favourite smuggler. Number 5. Mark Hamill's own number was used on screen Mark Hamill was originally set to unleash a long series Serial number to 3PO after just about surviving potentially becoming a whole lot thinner in a trash compactor. Only when it came time to shoot the sequence on the day, the blocking meant that Harrison Ford was closer to the door, meaning that the Luke Skywalker actor couldn't preserve his phone number forever on film. But after begging and pleading for Ford to utter his digits instead, the solo actor finally acquiesced before firing a happy now you big baby back at a Hamill, who quickly realised he was acting like a two-year-old during the exchange. He seemingly got his wish though, and that's apparently Hamill's own digits being declared by Solo in the flick. Number 4. What went into that original lightsaber sound? You've done it, I've done it, we've all done it. And by it, I of course mean making the iconic noise that comes after switching on a lightsaber, like you're just about to battle Darth Vader in a Death Star corridor. But what actually went into creating that legendary hum? Well, epic sound designer Ben Burt was once again behind the magic here, using what would have been a rather familiar noise for students at the time, a humming old 35mm projector, and a 70s tube TV to create what is now unquestionably the most imitated sound the galaxy far, far away has ever produced. Number 3. What you're actually looking at when it came to the lightsabers And while on the topic of the coolest weapon in the galaxy, the actual physical look of each of the lightsabers found in the first Star Wars flick themselves had very different real-life origins. When you're taking in Luke slash Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber, you're actually looking at a Greyflex camera side attached flash with a few slight modifications, and a micro Precision Products flash attachment was used for Darth Vader's trusty weapon. But it was Obi-Wan's lightsaber that proved to be the most complicated. Combining an Armatist Shank Starlight model handwheel, World War One No. 3 Mark I British rifle grenade, Browning ANM-2 machine gun booster, and a Rolls-Royce Derwent Mark VIII Mark IX jet engine balance pipe, to create the finished look of the old Space Wizard's tool of defense. What a combination, eh? Number 2. The familiar sounds that went into some psychic's voices And it just wouldn't be right to spend so much time talking about the various familiar sounds occupying the first ever trip to the galaxy far, far away without shining a light on the noises made by the real stars of the show, the trusty psychics. When it comes to Han Solo's loyal companion of Chewbacca, Ben Burt opted to combine a whole host of different mammals together for his many varying growls and roars including bears, badgers, seals, lions, and moaning walruses. And Bert also had a rather intriguing way of bringing R2-D2's various beeps and whistles into existence too. An ARP2600 analog synthesizer was mixed with his own vocalizations that were processed through other effects to create the baby-like cries and sounds associated with this cheeky little astromech. Number 1. Carrie Fisher's accent suddenly changes for one scene On one rather bizarre occasion early into episode 4, Princess Leia's intense conversation with Grand Moff Tarkin actually sees the late great Carrie Fisher's American twang suddenly flip into a full-blown British RP accent when stood opposite the formidable Peter Cushing. According to Fisher herself, the switch from American to RP in this moment was the result of a number of different factors. This scene was shot on her first day on set, and she had been studying acting at London Central School of Speech and Drama beforehand. Also, the understandable nerves that come with acting opposite a powerhouse like Cushing, and many of Lucas's lines being notoriously difficult to deliver, all led to Fisher snapping into her British accent for just this one Alderaan exploding moment. The beat was eventually made part of canon, however, with the Star Wars Bloodline novel stating that Leia was simply mocking Tarkin's voice in this moment. Sounds about right. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 5 The Empire Strikes Back. Number 20 Luke Never Fires His Blaster. 
When you can rely on something as unquestionably cool and effective as a damn laser sword, opting for a generic blaster can best be described as a somewhat uncivilized alternative. And that's an opinion Luke Skywalker seemingly shared with his one-time master Obi-Wan Kenobi, with the son of Anakin never actually firing off a blaster shot at any stage in The Empire Strikes Back. That's right, despite wandering the halls of Cloud City with his weapon ready to fire, and regularly being spotted with it on his person, not once does the Jedi in training choose to pull the the trigger in the sequel. Number 19, an elephant and seal were used for those Wampa whales. Throwing poor old Luke into a pretty rough spot out of the gates, episode 5 sees the rebel hero being imprisoned by a fierce abominable snowman-like being known as a Wampa. Viciously taking down Skywalker's Tauntaun before dragging his knocked out figure back to his icy lair, the unsettling shrieks this mountain of white terror unleashed weren't actually as alien as the monster itself. According to masterful sound designer Ben Burt, a combination of a lion eating a cow's head, elephants erupting and a squawking sea lion all help bring to life the startling wails of the fearsome beast at various points in its showing. Number 18, a lightsaber reversal. Staying within the Wampa's freezing home, one of Luke's first real examples of him successfully using the Force comes during the moment the unlucky Jedi finds himself hanging upside down in the cave. And more on that later. Skywalker is able to successfully force pull his lightsaber and slash his way out of the ice before chopping down his captor and making a break for it. And while you would have been forgiven for just assuming this brilliant practical effect was achieved via some expert wire work, you'd actually only be half right. Because while wires were very much used to assist Mark Hamill's epic force yanking out of the snow, they were actually used to pull the lightsaber from his hand rather than to it. This moment was then reversed later on, meaning that you're really watching a backwards version of a lightsaber falling to the ground here. Mind blown. Number 17, the force is strong with upside down Skywalker. And while on the topic of an upside down Luke, the galaxy's most reliable hero doesn't half have a habit of ending up in that rather specific position over the course of The Empire Strikes Back. Far from being a bizarre coincidence though, the force sensitive protagonist's regular hanging and standing upside down can actually be linked to the way his world is somewhat flipped on its head during these particular moments. The aforementioned Hoth suspending comes during a moment when Luke is likely realizing he's not as bulletproof as he felt he was post Death Star destruction. His Dagobah headstand comes in the thick of discovering the true ways of the Force, and his Cloud City dangling swiftly follows Vader's iconic father revelation. How's that for some Force-sensitive symbolism, eh? Number 16, a burning Imperial pilot in space. In a far more brutal instance of a Star Wars character having their world turned upside down, the 1980 classic's epic asteroid field chase comes equipped with a blink and you'll miss it reminder of just how deadly and morbidly hilarious space can actually be. With the Millennium Falcon being hunted down by a set of Imperial TIE fighters during the sequence, one of the Empire's pilots suddenly gets a little too close to an asteroid. As the ship is well and truly destroyed, however, slowing down the footage reveals a tiny little pilot being fired from the wreckage whilst being very much on on fire himself. Talk about going out in a blaze of shockingly comical glory. Number 15, a matte painting Bespin background. Long before George Lucas got his hands on a green screen, the go-to solution for creating a larger-than-life or out-of-this-world background involves some incredibly gifted artists producing frequently outstanding matte paintings. And arguably some of the most impressive pop-up during The Empire Strikes Back's spell on Cloud City. Along with the unquestionably gorgeous Bespin metropolis seen behind the Millennium Falcon as it lands in the unmistakable locale, the the eerie chasm within the city which plays host to Vader and Skywalker's game-changing duel was also largely brought to life through astounding paintings. Even with that knowledge in mind though, it's still fairly hard not to get lost in a beautifully realized setting that feels about as real as the world outside your window. Number 14, a Doctor Who Bounty Hunter cameo. You'd be surprised just how many props and costumes have found themselves being recycled on the big and small screen over the years. And likely even more shocked to discover that a piece of Doctor Who history actually managed to wiggle its way into the galaxy far, far away all those years ago. Those loyal Whovians all over the galaxy probably found themselves suffering from a bit of deja vu when slimy Bounty Hunter Bosk first wandered onto the Episode 5 scene. That's because the eye-catching space 
suit the Trandoshan is seen sporting actually first popped up in 1966's The Tenth Planet episode from the Doctor Who series. In that episode, a similar looking Windak flight suit is worn by a human figure, though it isn't 100% known whether this was the exact same costume that would be later used 14 years on in The Empire Strikes Back. But at the very least, both Bosk and this Who figure shared a fondness for this type of distinct yellow jumpsuit. Number 13, it's the only time Tatooine doesn't show up in the first six Skywalker Saga films. Easily ranking as the most well-known and important planet taking up a spot in the galaxy far, far away. The home of Luke and Anakin Skywalker regularly acts as the backdrop to some of the series' most iconic moments. But what tends to be lost in all of the Frosty Hoth skirmishes and hand-chopping that goes down in Episode 5 is the fact that this movie actually sits as the only one within the prequel and original trilogies not to showcase a scene happening happening on Tatooine. And as another interesting piece of often overlooked trivia, Tatooine's appearances in episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 9 mean that it ranks as the planet with the most appearances in the Skywalker Saga 2. Number 12, Vader and C-3PO's only original trilogy scene together happens here. Speaking of Tatooine's importance within the Star Wars franchise, this was also the planet that Anakin Skywalker was ultimately revealed to have built everyone's favourite neurotic droid C-3PO on. Throughout much of the original trilogy, however, Darth Vader and his creation don't actually share all that many scenes together. With the one and only instance of the pair reuniting actually coming as Han Solo is about to be frozen in carbonite. And in the case of some fans perhaps adding their own little pieces of canon into the mix for some additional fun, the sight of Vader keeping Boba Fett from firing on a frustrated Chewbacca with 3PO on his back has been interpreted as the Dark Lord not wanting to harm his one-time robotic pal all these years later. Because Lucas definitely had this all mapped out from the beginning, right? Right? Number 11, Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford were drunk on Cloud City. As the late great Carrie Fisher would eventually reveal many years down the road, both herself and Harrison Ford don't do an awful lot of smiling as their Leia Organa and Han Solo respectively struggle to evade the Empire in Episode 5. But on one specific occasion, the two could very much be spotted smirking like naughty school kids when walking around on Cloud City. And this was mostly down to the fact the pair of party animals were still a bit drunk from the wild evening before. So that night of partying involved everything from the Rolling Stones to Monty Python's Eric Idol to what was described as a Tunisian death drink, with the end results forcing the leading stars who hadn't slept a wink to crack a set of still somewhat intoxicated grins when encountering Lando Calrissian for the first time in the series. Number 10, Boba Fett's face is briefly glimpsed. While he may have grown into one of the most adored figures in the galaxy on the back of his rather mysterious live-action debut in The Empire Strikes Back, in reality the reveal of precisely who was hiding underneath that iconic Mandalorian helmet actually went down under fans' very noses in Episode 5. Brought to life by Jeremy Bullock during his original trilogy days, the actor behind Boba Fett actually rocked up without a mask on Cloud City, playing Galactic Empire Lieutenant Shekel as Leia tries to warn Luke that he'd wandered into a trap. This wasn't always the plan, though. Bullock simply stepped in late on in the wake of the original Shekel actor suddenly not being available to shoot on the day. Number 9, no special effects were needed for Hoth Blizzard. Episode 5 may not boast the sort of relentless CGI and special effects pumped into the galaxy throughout the prequel trilogy, thank heavens, but the brilliant minds behind the various alien planets, technology, and characters found in The Empire Strikes Back still threw their fair share of mind-blowing technical feats into the sequel. However, when it came time to shoot the relentlessly snowy sequences on Hoth involving the rebels trying to fight off both the incoming Empire and some seriously treacherous weather, that latter element didn't really require any digital or practical wizardry at all. So the next time you take in the moment involving Luke Skywalker trying his best to keep from freezing to death post Wampa escape, do so with the knowledge of Mark Hamill being genuinely and rather cruelly dumped in the middle of a legit snowstorm, while the rest of the cast and crew watched on from the comfort of a nice warm hotel close by with a cup of joe. Number 8, Alcatraz helped bring a Vader moment to life. It turns out that none other than the most famous prison facility on the planet helped create one of the most intimidating big bads in the galaxy's many unsettling moments. When listening to the sound of the doors on Vader's Star Cruiser slam shut during Episode 5, what you're actually hearing is the noise of an entire block of Alcatraz cell doors slamming with the flicking of one big ol' switch. This was reportedly captured by Lucas himself during a visit to the notorious prison, and it definitely helped add some extra real-world terror to the already formidable spacecraft. Number 7, Ralph McQuarrie's Hoth Walk-On 
Concept designer and all-round legendary illustrator Ralph McQuarrie's fingerprints are all over the Star Wars universe. And not just that, but McQuarrie himself also managed to land a cheeky cameo showing during Episode 5 too. Walking in front of one of the matte painting backgrounds that he helped bring into being, the brilliant artist takes on the small cameo role of General Fal McQuarrie on Hoth. See what they did there? Also, this brief rebel base shot came equipped with sneaky appearances from fellow concept artists Joe Johnston, Harrison Ellenshaw, and Michael Pangrazio. Number 6, A Potato Asteroid Field. Jumping back into the perilous moment involving Han Solo and the gang trying to keep from getting blown to pieces by some incoming TIE fighters amidst a field of asteroids, said floating rocks in space actually weren't all that they initially seemed in some cases. As noted by some of the brilliant minds behind everything from the Millennium Falcon to the humongous space rocks in question, when trying to land on a design for these asteroids, the team finally decided on a look that someone quickly pointed out looked similar to a potato. Without missing a beat, it was soon decided that throwing a bunch of actual spuds into the distant background of the asteroid belt wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. So if you look closely enough, you'll definitely catch a few floating taters threatening to collide with the Falcon. Number 5. Boba Fett is never mentioned by name. From the very second he showed up in the middle of a collection of unsettling bounty hunters on Darth Vader's Star Destroyer in The Empire Strikes Back, most instantly found themselves gripped by their best guy sporting badass that is Boba Fett. That being said, those who hadn't sat through the debacle that was the Star Wars Holiday Special, gone mad over the newest must-have Star Wars action figure beforehand, or chosen to stick around for Episode 5's end credits, would have been forgiven for having next to no clue who this not exactly talkative masked figure actually was. Why? Well, because Fett's name isn't actually said at any point in The Empire Strikes Back, with his first big screen mention by name surprisingly coming in E.T. the Extraterrestrial two years later. Number 4, Captain Wedge Antilles tied Luke as the deadliest figure on show. Though it was admittedly nowhere near as deadly as the episode that came before it, you know, the one that saw a planet get destroyed, The Empire Strikes Back did still involve a grand total of 46,987 beings being taken out at various stages in the tale. What likely will come as a rather significant shock to those who have regularly consumed the grittier follow-up to A New Hope, however, is precisely which on-screen figure is responsible for the tied most kills in Episode 5. According to List of Deaths Wiki, alongside the supposed hero of the day, Luke Skywalker, none other than Captain Wedge Antilles can claim to being the deadliest presence in the 1980 hit. Both rebel men killed 43 individuals each, sitting a significant way above Chewbacca's third place total of seven. So much for being the good guys, eh? Number three, kids actually played rebel extras. Potatoes weren't the only unexpected elements sneakily chucked into episode five's action. During the moments that play out within the rebels' base on the snowy world of Hoth, Many a child was actually dressed up as a rebel soldier and worker scurrying around in the background. This was done in order to help enhance the feeling of the hangar being far bigger than it actually was when shooting. And it worked a treat, to be honest, with it being rather difficult to spot that those troopers and freedom fighters in the distance were actually little more than kids playing dress up. And who wouldn't love the chance to run around on a Star Wars set all day, right? Number two, rebels use bubble wrap for reasons. That scene during the shots of Luke and Wedge trying to disable the formidable AT. 80s on Hoth, or at at if you're that kind of person, both rebel murderers can actually be found sporting random sheets of bubble wrap on their seatbelts. Was this actually some sort of alien material capable of ensuring the pilots would be safe from harm should they crash land into the tundra below? Yeah, possibly. But it's more likely this was little more than a cheap way to add some detail to an otherwise bland looking prop on the day. Bubble wrap was also found on the seatbelts of the Millennium Falcon too, with Star Wars lover and director Ryan Johnson opting to leave it there when guiding episode 8 onto the big screen. Number 1, Yoda's hut was made from his escape pod. After first encountering the quirky alien life form on the swampy planet of Dagobah in episode 5, Luke is invited into Yoda's hut for a bite to eat, before finding out that he's actually conversing with the powerful Jedi Master he's been searching for. What many likely didn't realize during this and the numerous other moments spent inside of Yoda's home, though, is that said hut is actually partially made up of parts from the escape pod that brought him to the planet all those years ago. As revealed in a Revenge of the Sith deleted scene, Yoda landed on the planet strong with the Force in an E3 standard starship lifeboat. He would then go on to live in the ship for a time before it began to degrade, and was ultimately consumed by the swamp a year into his exile. So Yoda decided to force 
forge a new home, one that came equipped with some of the materials he could salvage from the broken down pod slash home. He even powered his new gaff using the lifeboat's backup power supply. But as impressive as the Jedi Master's ability to improvise and evolve to his surroundings may be, it's definitely difficult to look at his home the same way after realising it likely serves as a painful constant reminder of the world he left behind post Order 66. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 6 Return of the Jedi. Number 20, Yoda is the only Jedi to die of natural causes on screen. Over the years, the likes of Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon Jinn, Luke Skywalker, and many more have either sacrificed themselves to help protect a hopeful future, or have simply been cut down by the forces of evil in the galaxy on screen. In fact, pretty much every Jedi ever to pop up in a Star Wars movie has found themselves passing over to the other side after being killed or sacrificing themselves at one point or another. All except one. And said only moment of a Jedi passing away due to natural causes comes during Return of the Jedi as a rather Master Yoda eventually pops his clogs after living to the ripe old age of 900. After taking a similar amount of time to squeeze out his final few lines, of course. Number 19, the first on screen female droid. While Phoebe Waller Bridges L337 may act as the first real primary female droid to make their presence known in the galaxy far, far away, doing so in Solo, a Star Wars story, she wasn't actually the first lady droid to appear on our screens. It took two whole movies before George Lucas and the gang found a way to unleash Star Wars' first notable droid that didn't identify as a male, with Episode 6 debuting EV-99 during C-3PO and R2-D2's time as Jabba the Hutt's new gifts, coldly ordering the famous protocol droid and Astromech to act as Jabba's new interpreter and accompany him on his sail barge, respectively. EV-99's chilling debut came equipped with the first moving droid mouth, too. The Mandalorian fans will also likely recognize the droid for her brief appearances in the series, whilst working as a bartender in the wake of being reprogrammed after Jabba's death, with Mark Hamill voicing the female droid on this occasion. Number 18, a director ATSD cameo. After George Lucas and Irving Kirshner had directed the prior two entries into the Skywalker saga, it was over to Richard Marquand to lead the final chapter of the original trilogy. And while Lucas and Kirshner would resist the urge to throw themselves into the Star Wars goodness for a throwaway cameo during their time in the director's seat, before the former would go all blue in episode 3 of course, Marquand did find a way to subtly get in on the on-screen action. As Return of the Jedi reaches its thrilling climax on Endor, look closely at the Imperial folks steering the AT-ST through the Forest Moon. The late Marquand, whose character went by that same name in Legends Continuity before being rechristened Newland, would proceed to be battered by a few Ewoks in the end before Chewbacca hijacked his destructive vehicle. Number 17, Lando's Disappearing Gloves. With so many bodies flying through the air and folks meeting their Sarlacc doom during the thrilling mission that takes up the movie's first act, you'd be forgiven for missing a rather tiny detail amidst the madness. Keep an eye on a flailing Lando Calrissian as the smooth-talking figure is launched off the side of a barge above the Dune Sea, or more specifically, his hands. As Lando hangs on for dear life in the immediate aftermath of being sent overboard, Billy D. Williams' character is seen sporting a pair of black gloves. Then, when the scene cuts to more close-up shots of the star, Lando is very much gloveless. This was likely down to William's stunt double needing the mitts to protect his own during the dangling moment more than anything else. Or perhaps Lando just possesses the ability to quickly glove and unglove in the blink of an eye. I vote the former. Number 16, it's the only Skywalker saga movie not to contain a blue lightsaber. There was actually a time when Luke Skywalker was going to be seen sporting yet another blue lightsaber over the course of Episode 6, with the leading figure being found wielding that very colour of blade on the film's original posters and during the Return of the Jedi's teaser trailers too. Ultimately, the call was reportedly made to change up that hue due to the blade clashing with the blue sky above during the opening Tatooine sequence. And in swapping out the blue for the green for Luke's new lightsaber, Return of the Jedi ended up becoming the only Skywalker saga feature not to showcase a blue variation of the sacred weapon, if you don't count those early posters and promotional material, which I do not. Number 15, Luke's Obi-Wan lightsaber connection. It turns out that Luke Skywalker's sparkly new green lightsaber also had a rather interesting and easily overlooked connection to his fallen masters. As revealed many years down the road during Mark Hamill's pop culture quest show, the prop the star used when battling against Vader on the second Death Star was actually the very same one Sir Alec Guinness wielded as his special effects lightsaber in A New Hope. Along with being a fantastic piece of behind-the-scenes trivia, this weapon actually being a reused version of one of Guinness's props brilliantly connects the canon backstory of Luke using materials and notes 
sword found in Obi-Wan's home on Tatooine to create his new blade, to the lightsaber action seen in Episode 6 too. Number 14. The real-world inspiration behind various alien languages Part of what helps make the galaxy far, far away feel like a vibrant, multicultural universe is the fact that not all characters within it speak English, or galactic basic as it's known in the Star Wars sphere. When it comes to the many alien languages heard being spoken over the course of the Skywalker saga and beyond though, the majority of these seemingly extraterrestrial native tongues have far more earthy origins than you likely realized. In Return of the Jedi alone, Huttese, the language spoke by the mighty Jabba the Hutt, was based on Quechua, the main language of the Incan Empire. Elsewhere, Lando's co-pilot Nian Nyum is seen speaking Kikuyu, a regional Kenyan language, whenever he unleashes his native Solustan tongue. And lastly, the Ewokese heard in the picture was inspired heavily by the Tibetan and Kalmyk Oret languages. Number 13. Blinking Ewoks in the Blu-ray Edition the little furry balls of fury known as the Ewoks could regularly be found providing the cuteness and taking down many an Imperial in Return of the Jedi. What you would not have caught one of the Endor natives doing, however, was, well, blinking. Not until the release of the updated Blu-ray editions of the original trilogy in 2011 at least. According to Warwick Davis when having a chat on Return of the Jedi's Blu-ray commentary, the original plan was to use a mechanism that allowed the Ewoks to practically blink on set while shooting. However, that didn't work out so the call was made to just leave the teddy bears staring into our souls during each and every one of their appearances. Fast forward a few years though and George Lucas found a way to tinker away this surreal detail, producing an even more bizarre CGI blink whenever the aliens were enjoying a close-up. Number 12. Ewoks are never mentioned by name. And speaking of Ewoks, nobody ever did precisely that in the entirety of this 132-minute OG trilogy finale. That's right, they may have been one of the major reasons the Rebels were ultimately able to take down the Empire once and for all, at this point anyway. But not a single alien or human on screen ever once referenced the names of the furry little race seen battering many a stormtrooper in Episode 6. Thankfully, the creatures and some of their specific names were at least mentioned in the film's end credits. But the fact the likes of Han, Leia, Luke, and 3PO never once uttered the name of the race or deliver a throwaway cheers wicket is often easily overlooked when thinking about their part in the Return of the Jedi story. Number 11, a familiar canine helped create the Rancor's growls. With one blood-curdling roar, Jabba the Hutt's rancor quickly established itself as one of the most fearsome beasts ever to stomp its way through the galaxy far, far away. In truth though, those horrifying screams actually had some rather diminutive real-world origins. Listen closely and you may be able to catch what sounds like a rather low-pitched bark slash growl from a canine. Far from sitting next to a ferocious Rottweiler or German Shepherd and capturing their intimidating growls for their towering rancor though, sound designer Ben Burt actually recorded the sound of his neighbor's little dash and barking before lowering the pitch to produce the beastie sound. And just like that, you'll never look at this giant pet the same way again. Number 10. Vader's Upside Down Lightsaber Nothing says tough love quite like launching your lightsaber at your baby boy in the middle of a deadly duel on the Death Star 2. But if you slow down that very moment of the one-time Anakin Skywalker hurling his trusty weapon at Luke with the Emperor watching on, it soon becomes clear that there was something a little off about this father-son experience, besides from the obvious. On closer inspection, Vader's lightsaber is actually shown to be emitting the weapon's laser blade out of the wrong end when flying through the air. But Lucas appears to have still found a way to ignore this rather strange error in his many OG trilogy updates. CGI eyelids for Ewoks though? Well, you got it. Number 9. Is that you, Captain Rex? On the back of a welcome return to the animated Star Wars sphere throughout the Rebels series, Captain Rex was ultimately confirmed in the show's epilogue to have been present during the Battle of Endor seen going down in Return of the Jedi. So that appeared to all but confirm that the bearded soul known as Nick Sant, seen gunning down stormtroopers and joining forces with Ewoks in Episode 6, was actually the legendary clone trooper who once fought alongside Anakin Skywalker. Despite Rebels executive producer Dave Filoni at one time feeling this was most definitely the case, however, the series ultimately left this particular revelation somewhat open to interpretation. With it not 100% being confirmed that the bearded rebel was Rex and not Sand, and Filoni being fine with the fact that he quote-unquote left it in a state where you could believe one way or the other. Number 8. Luke has the high ground. 
Returning to Luke's fateful duel with his old man now, and to an easily missed nod to the past that initially meant very little to the average Star Wars fan back in 1983. Fast forward a few decades to the time post-release of Revenge of the Sith though, and the green-bladed Skywalker's decision to take a rather specific position now brings back some particularly painful Mustafa memories. As Vader notes how Obi-Wan has taught you well, notice how Luke very much has the high ground after knocking the half-machine Sith down some steps. Kenobi, of course, took up a similar position position in the lead up to Anakin's arrogant decision to launch himself at his one-time master amidst the lava in episode 3. And Vader's apparent remembering of that life-changing mistake during this equally important moment helps subtly connect the two trilogy endings and significant events in his life with a once throwaway line. Number 7. Stormtroopers Drag Through the Street in Celebration with the galaxy finally safe from the villainous rule of the Empire, updated versions of Return of the Jedi famously offered a few glimpses at the celebrations taking place on planets such as Naboo, Tatooine, and Coruscant. But it was on that last planet that a rather chilling visual was dragged under the noses of the majority of folks taking in these joyful parties. Coruscant, aka Imperial Center, was famously the capital under the Emperor's rule. Yet the minute said Dark Lord of the Sith was toppled, the civilians on that world went about tearing down his statue, and a full blown riot was said to eventually broken out, one that saw the killing of a number of civilians at the hands of the police force on the planet. In episode 6, however, fans only really see the beginnings of that riot. With the aforementioned statue tumbling and a stormtrooper being dragged through the crowd in Monument Plaza, as a Wilhelm scream can briefly be heard in the thick of the cheers. Number 6, it's the only time Luke addresses his master as Obi-Wan. After watching the all-powerful Master Yoda become one with the Force within his tiny home on Dagobah, Luke Skywalker wanders right into a pretty awkward conversation with one of his other deceased masters. That's when Luke suddenly calls out to this fallen Jedi, referring to the Force spirit as Obi-Wan for the first and only time during the pair's time spent together on screen during the original trilogy. Though you would be forgiven for overlooking that detail amongst all the certain point of view nonsense and sister revelations said conversation also contained. Yet Luke would then return to calling his truth-bending master Ben during that same exchange. So perhaps this was just a brief moment of frustration being let out by the reeling Jedi in the making, on the back of having his world flipped upside down by Vader's father Bombshell. Still think he handled that rather well. Number 5. Anakin's skeleton is briefly visible. Darth Vader finally edges back towards the light side by dumping the wrinkly a-hole he once called Master down a reactor shaft late in Return of the Jedi. In the wake of a few special edition additional cries of no though, many fans were too busy cringing in their seats or punching the air in joy at the sight of Darth Sidious being gorilla pressed by the man machine to spot a particularly awesome detail during this galaxy changing moment. As Vader impressively lifts the Emperor with one good hand, Anakin Skywalker's skeleton can sporadically be seen as the hooded Sith shocks through his system. Then, after eventually launching Sidious, the Chosen One's massively augmented frame is once again visible for a few seconds as he takes a quick breather post-throw, highlighting many of the robotic elements that have been installed into his skeleton. Obi-Wan wasn't wrong. His former Padawan was very much more machine than man at this point. Number 4. Jabba the Tat the slimy Jabba the Hutt more than made an impact during his various appearances in the original trilogy. Yet despite it often being pretty hard to take your eyes off of this massive gangster slug whenever he wriggled onto the scene, most didn't actually catch a subtle detail on the Hutt's person throughout his impactful Return of the Jedi moments in particular. As the criminal Empire leader is found drooling over Princess Leia, roaring at 3PO within his palace, and chilling on his sail barge, his right forearm is actually shown to be boasting an easily missed tattoo. Said ink is said to be of the Desilijic Kaj symbol, a mark that highlighted Jabba's role as the leader of the Desilijic Tyor clan. Try saying that ten times fast. Number three, it's the only film where Vader doesn't unleash a force choke. Almost as iconic as the sound of the most recognizable force of evil in the galaxy's breathing is the sight of Darth Vader using the force to cut off an unsuspecting fool's air supply. But in a move that perhaps reflected how the one-time Anakin Skywalker had been spending the entire movie edging back towards the light, Vader isn't actually seen choking any Imperials or Rebels throughout Return of the Jedi. Had the decision been made to leave in one of Episode 6's deleted scenes, however, the Emperor's right-hand man would have maintained his 100% choking record in Star Wars movies. With Vader originally gripping Commander Jajerod via the Force after not being granted access to his master's throne room. Rookie mistake. Said choke never made the cut though, so Return of the Jedi still sits as the only choke-free entry on Vader's big screen CV. Number 2. Only one X-Wing pilot survived all three original trilogy movies. 
Time and time again during the Rebel Alliance's attempts to take the Empire down once and for all, a great many brave pilots were suddenly blown to smithereens by everything from enemy TIE fighters to Star Destroyers. Throughout all of the perilous missions to take out Death Stars and AT-ATs though, one mighty Rebel X-Wing pilot managed to keep from somehow biting the dust. Sitting as the only X-Wing flying character outside of Luke Skywalker to survive all three original trilogy movies, Wedge Antilles could always be counted on to keep his cool when the pressure was at its highest. And the uncanny killable pilots would even pop up many years later alongside old pal Lando Calrissian during the Resistance's Exegol attack on the First Order during the closing stages of The Rise of Skywalker. What a hero! Number 1. 2 million plus deaths in total go down and Lando was responsible for most of them. Peace came at quite the price during the events of Return of the Jedi, with a grand total of 2,218,448 individuals all ultimately dying during the Rebel Alliance's successful overthrowing of the Empire. The most notable of those deaths undoubtedly came in the form of Darth Vader, Yoda, Jabba the Hutt, and the Emperor, for a bit at least. Yet what is often ignored is precisely who was responsible for the vast majority of that astronomical number of fatalities during Episode 6. General Lando Calrissian held the chilling record of being the deadliest individual Return of the Jedi had to offer, murdering a grand total of 1,844,137 people when blasting the Empire's second space station to smithereens, according to List of Deaths Wiki. At least it wasn't all for nothing and the Empire were finally wiped from the galaxy for good after being left with all that blood on his hands slash gloves though. Oh, oh wait, no, that didn't happen. Ah, so much for that then. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Number 20, and anything but waterfall. Despite many being quick to take aim at George Lucas for his over-reliance on CGI and digital tinkering, throughout not only this first prequel entry but the trilogy in general, there were actually more brilliant practical elements than you'd likely have ever expected here. Look no further than the inspired foundation of Naboo's Theed Waterfalls in Episode 1, with the awesome ILM digital effects artist Dean Yerk using falling salt as the basis for what appeared to be the streams of tumbling water. Now there are a few more additional elements pumped into the mix in order to nail the desired finished article, including a matte painting background, the incorporating of miniatures, some added CGI particles, and even some digital birds. But the record will always show that Naboo's mesmerizing waterfalls all started out as little more than bags of salt pouring down some black velvet curtains being draped over scaffolding. Number 19, Palpatine's subtle dig at the Jedi Code. The eventual Emperor Palpatine actually offered up one of his first teases of his long-term plan to destroy the Jedi Order during one blink and you'll miss it exchange in The Phantom Menace. At one point in Episode 1, Senator Sheev Palpatine can be heard declaring, There is no civility, only politics. And to the average Joe or Jane, this may appear as little more than a throwaway utterance. But to those who have studied the Jedi Code, this feels like much more of a pointed dig at Palp's mortal enemy. Throughout the Jedi Code's mantra, phrases such as there is no emotion, there is peace can be found, acting as a negative statement followed by a positive one. In the Jedi's eyes, at least. So was Sheev's similar yet slightly corrupted use of words here little more than a compelling coincidence? Or the first flickers of his true form of Darth Sidious starting to come to the surface within the Senate? I votes the latter. Number 18, Natalie Portman's voice was electronically lowered. As another way of differentiating between the Queen and one of her handmaidens when accompanying the Jedi on their unexpected trip to the sandy planet of Tatooine, along with deciding on a classical tone for her former persona that took inspiration from the likes of Catherine Hepburn and Lauren Bacall with a vocal coach, Natalie Portman's voice was actually lowered somewhat in post-production. This was an attempt to add a little more gravitas to Portman's Queen persona, an effect that was surprisingly missing during the film's initial trailers. So perhaps Lucas only made this vocal call fairly late in the day upon taking in said first round of teasers. Number 17, Naboo's interiors were shot in an actual palace. One film before George Lucas decided to go blue screen crazy, it turns out that a rather epic real-life location was actually used as the backdrop for some of the Royal Palace of Thebes grand halls. Genuinely using an actual palace for Queen Amidala's own royal gaff, Lucas took his crew to Naples' Royal Palace of Caserta for many of the Thebes Palace interior shots. The Italian monument was constructed back in the 1750s and can claim the title of being the largest royal palace on the planet, and one fit for a space opera queen as it goes. Number 16, Watto was actually crippled. 
What of Toydarian race would ultimately become a consistent part of the Star Wars universe, with Toydaria popping up during the animated Clone Wars series in particular. And one of the most notable features of this alien species comes in the form of the Toydarians' reliance on using their wings to get around the place despite boasting a set of fully functioning legs. Well, in most cases. When it comes to arguably the most famous Toydarian of the lot, however, it turns out Watto was actually relying on his wings for another reason. According to the script for Episode 1, the Tatooine junk dealer and slave owner was left crippled to the point of not being able to use both legs, with one foot being longer than the other if you look very closely. Number 15, Leia's Golden Bikini Returns it wouldn't be a prequel Star Wars adventure without a few glorious cameo appearances along the way. But before I get to those soon-to-be famous faces and family affairs, it's time to shine a light on the sneaky return of a rather iconic get-up that first reared its head during Return of the Jedi. As first sported by Princess Leia Organa herself during her time as Jabba the Hutt's prisoner in Episode 6, that golden bikini was on show once again during Jabba's Phantom Menace appearance, as his then-current slave unfortunately found herself donning the same revealing outfit fit during the Tatooine pod race. Number 14, a who's who of soon-to-be-famous cameos. It's not too difficult to understand why absolutely every actor worth their salt was lining up for a part, no matter the size, in the prequel chapter of the Skywalker saga. So the Phantom Menace wasn't exactly lacking in the soon-to-be-famous faces category when it came to those many folks occupying the background at various points in Episode 1. The Hobbits Richard Armitage and the Wire's Dominic West both acted as members of Queen Amidala's palace guard at various points. Sofia Coppola stepped into the Star Wars sphere as Sashay, and even eventual Oscar nominee Sally Hawkins wound up taking on the role of extra during the film's closing celebration scene. Number 13, the first time Anthony Daniels didn't physically play C-3PO. Anthony Daniels showing as C-3PO in The Phantom Menace actually acted as something of a first for the franchise. Instead of providing the physical movements for 3PO as he had done in the prior three original trilogy entries, the nature of the Protocol Droid's comeback meant that a puppeteer had to be responsible for his presence on set for the first time ever. It wasn't through a lack of trying on Daniel's part, mind, with the committed actor feeling somewhat disappointed over not being able to physically bring the droid to life in Episode 1, to the point of requesting a go of the puppet job by the time Episode 2 came around. Despite putting in a sizable amount of effort to nail his puppeteering moment, though, the decision was ultimately made to scrap that design in favor of going back to a plated 3PO for a Attack of the Clones. Charming. Number 12, Anakin's theme subtly foreshadows Vader. Music has always been an extremely powerful tool within the Star Wars juggernaut, and in another example of using said almost always excellent themes as a way of foreshadowing certain beats that will eventually come to pass later in the Skywalker saga day, John Williams' work in bringing a young Anakin Skywalker's musical theme to life actually brought with it a rather subtle nod towards the Chosen One's dark future. If you listen closely to Little Annie's theme throughout The Phantom Menace, you'll hear the odd cheeky rendition of none other than the Imperial March nestled in the powerful tune. Another hint at what will become of the eventual Darth Vader in the closing stages of this prequel series. Number 11, the origins of a number of notable noises. Keeping with the sounds of this first episode of prequel filmmaking, it's always remarkable to learn precisely what real-world noises sit as the origin of some of the galaxy's most notable rackets. In the case of certain underwater monsters seen when Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi attempt to make their way to Thede with Jar Jar Binks, for example, those warbles can be attributed to none other than sound designer Ben Burt's own 18-month-old daughter, with the main sound tech claiming, at one point, she had a growl in her voice when she was crying, so I recorded that and then lowered the pitch way down in the computer. Elsewhere, Bert was said to have used the cheers and roars from a San Francisco 49ers game for the spectacular crowd noise used during the Tatooine pod race, and the force field seen during the climactic duel of the faints noise also reportedly started out as little more than the sound of one of the audio supervisor's neighbor's ceiling fan. Humble beginnings and all that. Number 10, the beginning of Master Quinlan Voss. You just never know which background entity is going to eventually find themselves becoming one of the unexpected breakout stars of your blockbuster feature, eh? In the case of The Phantom Menace, that bizarre honor was held by a debuting Master Quinlan Voss, or rather the Moss Esper background extra that was simply too damn cool to ignore and wound up acting as the inspiration for the character Master Quinlan Voss would ultimately become. Seen in a fleeting shot during Jar Jar Binks and Sebulba's scrap on Tatooine, Dark Horse comic writer John Ostrander and artist Jan Duracema took the awesome look of this dreadlocked and yellow-faced painted being and used it as the foundation for Voss in the Legends Star Wars Republic stories. 
and despite not quite making it back onto the live action stage in Revenge of the Sith, Voss was name dropped in the likes of Episode 3 and the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, along with rocking up in the Clone Wars animated show too. Number 9, Darth Maul only had three lines despite his TV spot monologue. If you were one of the many giddy folks heading into a showing of The Phantom Menace for the very first time back in 1999, you'd have been forgiven for wondering where in the holy hell all of the new big bad red lightsaber wielding in the galaxy's lines all wandered off to. That's because in one rather memorable One Truth TV spot in the lead up to Episode 1's release, Darth Maul was actually responsible for a deeply unsettling monologue about how fear was his ally. Only when the time came to actually witness this friend of fear strut his stuff on the big screen, said monologue was nowhere to be seen, with Maul, voiced by Peter Serafinowicz, only actually uttering a grand total of three lines during his 8.5 minutes of menace within the feature. He also only did something else three times too. Number 8, Darth Maul barely blinks. And it turns out that Darth Maul only ever lets loose an all-important blink on three occasions in The Phantom Menace 2. Far from simply being a technique conjured up by Ray Park and George Lucas from the get-go to give the Darth Mirian Zabrak a more unsettling vibe throughout though, this barely blinking idea was born out of the physical Maul performer actually being in agony every time he was forced to blink when donning the character's signature red and yellow contact lenses. Park used this pain to fuel his character's constant refusal to break eye contact. Number 7, Jar Jar Binks was the first ever fully CGI supporting character. Before Ahmed Best beat out Michael Jackson for the role of Bumbling Gungan and gave his performance of Binks while sporting a foam and latex Jar Jar suit and headgear that would later be replaced by a digital version of the side character, no fully CGI personality had ever taken on a part as a key supporting role in a movie. And while many were quick to overlook the fact that they were witnessing history unfolding in front of their very eyes in The Phantom Menace, due to Binks' many slapstick shenanigans largely being rejected by fans and critics alike, Nothing will take away Best and Bink's honor of being the CGI character who walked so that the likes of Gollum and many more could run slash crawl. Number 6, QT pod race spectators were a thing. Model maker Michael Lynch managed to pull off the ultimate illusion in his attempts to forge the sort of freakishly packed crowd of pod racing supporters needed for the Phantom Space Race. Probably sensing that trying to create fully digital fans would likely be too much work, and opting to rope in thousands of extras wouldn't have exactly been cheap either. For the many epic wide shots of the capacity crowd seen just before the pod race gets underway and during it, Lynch relied on something as simple as a boatload of Q-tips. Filling out his convincing miniature of the staggering stand with a whopping 450,000 painted little tips, Lynch would then proceed to make said cotton swabs move by blowing wind up from beneath them with a fan, giving off the illusion of the crowd naturally moving along with the thrill in action. Number 5, E.T. stops by in the Senate. Queen Amidala's move for a vote of no confidence set the stage for the Star Wars arrival nobody knew they needed in their lives. Sure enough, as the camera pans around the Galactic Senate in the aftermath of Amidala's jaw-dropping statement, eagle-eyed fans were able to catch a quick glimpse of Steven Spielberg's pride and joy, E.T., or at least the alien species seen in E.T. the Extraterrestrial. With Spielberg and Lucas very much being pals in real life, this was likely nothing more than the latter's way of returning the favor to his mate. With the former unleashing a number of Star Wars Easter eggs in his Indiana Jones series in the years before The Phantom Menace. Number 4, three Wookiees were forged from one Chewie. It turns out that E.T.'s unexpected emergence wasn't the only compelling detail largely overlooked during this post-no-confidence Galactic Senate pipe bomb, with a much hairier gem of a cameo being far more than what meets the eye too. During the aforementioned panning around the Senate, a number of Wookiees are also seen reacting to Amidala's words. But instead of going through the hard work of forging three brand new grizzly costumes for such a fleeting showing of the towering furballs, it was decided that the OG Chewbacca suit would be used to its fullest potential. So an actor was dumped into that original Chewie costume and recorded three separate times, with each different version seeing the costume's hair changed ever so slightly. When the shots were put together, we ended up with three different Wookiees out of one suit. How's that for efficiency? Number 3, Ewan McGregor was forced to don a wig for reshoots. There must have been a few moments when Ewan McGregor was left questioning why he ever bothered committing to becoming a pivotal part of this galaxy far, far away. Away from having to utter hilariously dreadful lines about killing younglings and spending more time than anyone would prefer acting in front of a blue screen though, arguably the most awkward part of his Star Wars experience involved the numerous god-awful wigs he was forced into during the film's reshoots. Making matters worse, on top of numerous moments of McGregor blatantly showing off anything but legit locks being difficult to unsee once you spot them, some genius decided to use one of said reshoot short hair wigged images of McGregor on promotional posters for the incoming flick. 
Really couldn't have found any others, could you, mate? Number two, 327 references. It's pretty widely known that the number 1138 is fairly important and common in the world of Star Wars, but there is actually another number that receives a little bit of love in Episode 1. With a notable 327 popping up in the name of the Queen's J-Type 327 Nubian Royal Starship. Far from simply being a random collection of numbers though, much like 1138, 327 has popped up in Star Wars time and time again, after first appearing in Lucas's American Graffiti. The Empire Strikes Back boasted a landing platform on Bespin of the same number. Various droids and troops have also come equipped with that number over the years too. Number 1. It's got more practical effects than the OG trilogy combined. Again, contrary to what many would have you believe when it comes to the CGI-loving creator of the galaxy far, far away himself, it turns out that George Lucas wasn't actually as hell-bent on stuffing his prequel trilogy with and generally relying on digital wizardry as many would think. Now sure, The Phantom Menace and the two episodes that would follow are still weighed down by perhaps a touch more CGI than anyone was genuinely asking for heading into the entries, but it'll likely come as a shock to many to hear that the first episode of the prequels alone actually used more miniature sets and props than were forged for the entire entire original trilogy all those years ago. That being said, The Phantom Menace also completely blew these films out of the water on the digital front too, again coming in with more CGI than was used in those films combined. Yet the fact many were quick to overlook the former impressive fact when sitting down to take an episode 1 unfortunately tells the story of Lucas not quite striking the perfect balance between practical and digital over the course of a flick many understandably branded as soulless upon its debut all those years ago. 20 Things You Somehow Missed in Episode 2 Attack of the Clones Number 20. Christopher Lee's face was digitally placed onto a stunt double when fighting. Darth Sidious's latest apprentice and former Jedi Master by the name of Count Dooku was masterfully brought into being by the magnetic Christopher Lee throughout Attack of the Clones. Mostly, that is. With the iconic thespian coming in at an impressive 79 years of age at the time of shooting episode 2, it was a bit of a big ass to expect the Count Dracula legend to fully execute each and every intricate lightsaber exchange his villainous fallen Jedi was involved in despite his boasting of holding the record for the most cinematic sword fights ever. So to get around this, Lucas decided to remarkably slap a digital version of Lee's face on top of his stunt double for the more athletic sequences during his battles with Yoda, Anakin Skywalker, and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Though, Lee was still more than up for the task of throwing down with the likes of Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen when the time came for an intense close-up collision. Number 19, a Hot Rod American Graffiti Reference Away from his game-changing galaxy far, far away entries, arguably the most famous flick to bear the George Lucas stamp is one that helped put the iconic filmmaker's name on the map in the first place. Going by the name of American Graffiti, the Academy Award-nominated feature centers around a group of teens, their cars, and the shenanigans that unfold over the course of one compelling night. So in a sort of tip of the cap to the 1973 film that pretty much started it all for Lucas, the director seemingly opted to take inspiration from John Milner's unmistakable bright yellow hot rod when forging one of Attack of the Clones' most notable vehicles. A quick glance at Anakin Skywalker's chosen mode of XJ-6 airspeeder transport when darting around the skies of Coruscant in pursuit of Padme's attempted killer elicits instant memories of that aforementioned American graffiti classic 32 Ford Coupe. Number 18, The Awa's Original Trilogy Origins While it may only occupy the atmosphere of Kamino for a few still rather captivating beats, it turns out that the great flying Awa has quite the history within this galaxy far, far away. First being conceived by concept artist Ralph McQuarrie many moons ago when trying to figure out what beasties could be spotted amongst the clouds on Bespin in The Empire Strikes Back, budget restraints put a pin in its eye-catching usage for a time. Subsequent pitches to have the air whales pop up in both Return of the Jedi and The Phantom Menace, acting as Gungan mounts in the latter's case were then all passed up on before finally landing on bringing the majestic monsters into being amidst the choppy wave-filled clone homeworld. Number 17. Keep an eye on those Jedi Archive busts Before Obi-Wan Kenobi could actually rock up on the aforementioned sea planet of Kamino, however, the Inquisitive Jedi Master was first tasked with scouring the Jedi Archives for the location of this mysterious world. And with all this attention on figuring out where in the hell the vital system had disappeared to, you'd be forgiven for missing some rather important faces being showcased in and around this sacred location, in the form of a number of supremely polished busts. Among the representation of the Lost Twenty, the Jedi who turned their back on the Order over the years, is the facial sculpture of Christopher Lee's Count Dooku, of course. But in a cheeky set of cameos of sorts, 
Many of the statues crafted by ILM sculptor Richard Miller were actually of the behind-the-scenes creatives involved in the flick, with George Lucas animation director Rob Coleman and model supervisor Brian Gernand among the Jedi faces frozen in time. Number 16, it's the last Star Wars film released on VHS in the US. In another instance of, yes, you're getting rather old, my friend, it turns out that this technologically obsessed second prequel entry actually also acted as the last of a dying breed, too. With the age of the all-conquering DVD being well and truly upon us, Attack of the Clones holds the honor of being the last ever Star Wars flick to be released on VHS in the United States. That's because despite the now long since extinct taping tools still being in circulation around the time of 2005's Revenge of the Sith, the decision was made to only unleash those boxes on Europe and Australia, meaning the Attack of the Clones VHS was the last for the US. Number 15, a shark in an asteroid field. Almost stealing the whole damn show in the thick of Anakin and Padme's romantic frolicking in the fields of Naboo, the former's riding and eventual trampling at the hooves of an enthusiastic cow-like being wasn't actually the only time a shark was on show in this episode. As revealed by visual effects supervisor John Knoll, one of these ballooned-up beasties is actually present during the scene which sees Obi-Wan Kenobi soaring through Geonosis's asteroid belt. And if that wasn't enough, a shark easter egg is also apparently visible in some of the burning wreckage caused during the eventual battle of Geonosis. Number 14, a different tilt follows the crawl. Whereas the majority of Star Wars outings have been known to showcase the camera tilting downwards as the action eventually gets underway following the famous rising opening crawl text, Attack of the Clones is the only entry in the nine-film epic to go a literal different route, rising upwards following on from the final words of Assist the Overwhelmed Jedi to reveal the city planet of Coruscant. Alongside Rogue One, a Star Wars story, this remarkably acts as something of an anomaly when it comes to features set in a galaxy far, far away. Number 13, the subtle foreshadowing of Order 66. Fans were always well aware that the Jango Fett duplicates were destined to stab their Jedi allies in the back in the end. And in an attempt to subtly foreshadow that inevitable plunging in of the knife, George Lucas laced many a subtle detail into the clones' first showing on the live-action stage that hinted towards their incoming fate. First opting to introduce the substantial number of clone troops available to the Republic on Kamino to the sound of the Trade Federation march, this use of music that had accompanied the villainous forces last time out immediately suggested a dark future for the White Armored Warriors. And the same could be said of the use of the Imperial March in the film's closing stage too. And the fact that clones are seen charging from right to left instead of the more widely accepted heroic cinematic direction of left to right, don't ask, it's just a thing, when juking it out with the droids on Geonosis also subtly alludes to these lads being bad news later down the road. Number 12, the original trilogy C-3PO suit was used. Attack of the Clones saw the return of everyone's favorite wisecracking collection of neurotic circuits in Anthony Daniels' C-3PO. But instead of gifting the original trilogy staple a brand new mechanical costume to get to grips with over the course of his various non-CGI appearances on the likes of Tatooine, the original suit from those OG set of flicks was dusted off, repainted, and ultimately aged for usage in this prequel episode. Also, the original plan was for Daniels to puppeteer the skeleton version of Anakin's droid last seen in The Phantom Menace. But upon experiencing some understandable difficulty bringing the robot to life, the call was made to simply dump the actor back into his tried and tested plated suit whenever he wasn't being launched around a droid making factory instead. Number 11, it didn't top the box office charts for the year absolutely destroying their competition in just about every single calendar year a Star Wars adventure has made its way into our galaxy. There's a reason George Lucas's brainchild has gone on to become the second highest grossing movie franchise of all time, damn it, sitting only behind the unstoppable Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, despite still coming home with a staggering $653 million back in 2002, Attack of the Clones didn't actually walk out of the year as the single biggest blockbuster entry to have graced our screens. In fact, it didn't even break into the top three worldwide. According to Box Office Mojo, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man boasting $821 million, the second entry in the Harry Potter series in the Chamber of Secrets with $878 million, and Peter Jackson's second outing to Middle Earth with The Two Towers, which took in $936 million, all outperformed Lucas's Episode 2 when it comes to worldwide box office takings. The force wasn't as strong with this one as usual, it seems. Number 10, a bar full of familiar Star Wars faces. Upon entering one of the more vibrant hives of scum and villainy you're ever likely to find in their quest to find a slippery assassin, 
Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker find themselves in the presence of none other than C-3PO actor Anthony Daniels and Jar Jar Binks performer Ahmed Best, as the two actors take on Blink and you'll miss some extra roles within the Outlander Club. Joining these usually covered up entities in the background of this buzzing space club are also R2-D2 handler Don Buys and his talented droid unit of Zeynep Selsuk, Justin Dix and Trevor Tigay. Number 9, one of the few practical scenes. Sticking with this intergalactic clubland setting, it turns out that this was actually one of Hayden Christensen's favourite scenes to perform in. And no, not because it came equipped with a rather disturbing amount of G-strings for a supposedly PG family flick. Lucas, you're a naughty boy. The Coruscant nightclub sequence was actually one of the only scenes to not heavily rely on blue screen and effects that would be added in post-production. And all in all, very much being able to interact with a real-life set that had been carefully crafted for use in this rather tense portion of Attack of the Clones, gave the actors' exhausted imaginations a rest for a moment before it was back to pretending they were running around in a battle pit or on a constantly downpouring planet. Number 8, The Lucas Family Cameos Keeping it in the family when it comes to this film's seemingly never-ending string of cameos, George Lucas's kids were all gifted the chance to fulfill their Star Wars dreams over the course of Episode 2. Returning after background appearances in The Phantom Menace, both Amanda and Katie Lucas show up on screen at various moments in Attack of the Clones, with both appearing in the aforementioned Outlander Club as Ad Nama and a Twilight called Lune Minx, respectively. Elsewhere, Jet Lucas also makes his Star Wars bow as Jedi Padawan Warpok Skarmini in the already mentioned Jedi archive scene. Number 7, Hugh McGregor's sporadic fake beard and hair. Making it two for two when it comes to jarring reshoot hair, leaving Star Wars fans scratching their heads, Hugh McGregor was added again in the midst of shooting Attack of the Clones. After going out of his way to grow his hair out into a glorious mullet and let his facial fuzz flow for his role of a more mature Obi-Wan Kenobi, McGregor was forced to chop his locks and shave his face for his upcoming part in Ridley Scott's Black Hawk Down. Unfortunately for McGregor, Lucas opted to add some new scenes featuring the Jedi Master after wrapping up principal photography, leading to him being stuffed into a mullet wig and having a beard stuck onto his mug due to not having enough time to grow everything back post Black Hawk Down. Look no further than Kenobi's elevator reintroduction alongside Anakin for an example of fake face fuzz gone terribly wrong. Number 6, there's not a single practical clone trooper on show. While his over-reliance on digitally crafting the various alien species, unusual locales, and various set pieces seen in this entry of his galaxy far, far away, still divides fans to this day. Most would happily admit that the forging of Lucas's titular clone army, using almost only said method of computerized creation, is still a hugely impressive feat to this day. This is all according to animation director Rob Coleman, who has gone on record to confess that not a single clone trooper was physically fully crafted for the shoot, with each and every Django duplicate on screen being realized thanks to a combination of industrial light and magic employees strutting around in clone helmets and the occasional set of footwear for motion capture purposes, and the technological CGI whizzes doing the rest. Number 5, The Coincidental Vader Foreshadowing Alongside the eventual betrayal at the hands of the clone army, another prequel descent into darkness that was very much inevitable from the moment he arrived on the scene came in the form of Anakin Skywalker's inescapable transformation into the infamous Darth Vader. And while Lucas wasn't exactly shy about reminding folks of the fate heading this tortured Jedi's way over the course of his trilogy, setting a Vader shadow behind a young Annie in promotional material for The Phantom Menace, another seemingly Sith silhouette that would eventually rear its head in Attack of the Clones wasn't actually part of the original plan. Upon spotting the fact that Christensen's shadow unexpectedly resembled his character's future suited self when talking to his beloved on Tatooine, Lucas decided to quickly thrust this compelling development into frame for the exchange. Far from being another instance of Lucas' digital tinkering, as confirmed in the film's DVD commentary, this shadowy occurrence was merely an effective coincidence. Number 4, Mace Windu's epic lightsaber engraving. In case you needed another reminder of why Samuel L. Jackson still holds the honor of being the coolest mother effer in the galaxy, I direct you to one of the most incredible Star Wars Easter eggs ever to sneak into existence. Alongside demanding to have Mace Windu's own personal lightsaber stand out from the rest, nudging Lucas into giving him a rare purple variant so he could pick himself out in a crowded Geonosis skirmish, 
Jackson also managed to get away with a rather cheeky piece of engraving on said Jedi weapon. Bad Mother Effer are the immortal words supposedly carved into Windu's masterful saber. The exact words that are also printed on Jackson's character of Jules Winfield's wallet in Pulp Fiction. Whether or not this was actually scratched onto the lightsaber before or after shooting isn't 100% clear, but it's still mother effing epic all the same. Number 3, Jango Fett's Stormtrooper Blooper Callback. Sticking out as perhaps the most infamous but equally cherished blooper to ever be committed to the big screen. The sight of an unfortunate stormtrooper whacking their head on a blast door was so hard to ignore that George Lucas had no chance but to add an equally hilarious sound effect to the scenario in later editions of A New Hope. This isn't the only acknowledgement of this blatant cinematic cock-up within Star Wars canon though as Lucas once again tipped his cap to the clumsy stormtrooper during Jango Fett's departing from Kamino in Attack of the Clones. In a very much intentional callback to set a new hope head bonking, the bounty hunter smacks his own CGI noggin on his spaceship's door upon entering the craft. And just to hammer home the tribute, Lucas again decided to add a cartoonish thump sound effect during the comical moment Steel met Beska. Number 2, Boba Fett is learning on the job. And when it comes to the sequence that would ultimately follow this headbanging fleeing from Kenobi, George Lucas has gone on record via IMDb to state that Boba Fett's presence as Father Jango's co-pilot was not just a case of sitting back and enjoying the ride to Geonosis. And with there yet, Dad? This future bounty hunter was actually very much taking notes during his father's attempts to sniff out the Jedi master within Geonosis's asteroid field. This is seen in the fact that young Boba was able to take the reality of Obi-Wan managing to hide from the duo in the thick of the space rocks and apply it to his own pursuit of Han Solo in The Empire Strikes Back. Seeing through Solo's attempts to evade the Empire in the midst of some Star Destroyer garbage, all thanks to his Kenobi experience. Number 1, The Staggering Death Count Kicking off the war that would eventually engulf much of the galaxy for three years straight. It was safe to assume that not every single Jedi, droid, or innocent civilian seen over the course of Attack of the Clones' runtime was guaranteed to make it out alive. And according to List of Deaths Wiki, a frankly insane 203,769 personalities perished from start to finish when it comes to this 142-minute monster of a movie. And in case you were curious as to which characters were responsible for the most of these sudden endings, future menace of the galaxy Anakin Skywalker takes top spot with 30 kills. With Django Fett quite some way behind in second place with a still rather unsettling 10 fatalities. It's a bloody murderous film, let me tell thee. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Number 20, The Millennium Falcon. Revenge of the Sith gets underway with one of the most thrilling space skirmishes the entire Skywalker saga has ever brought into existence. And it's after the dust has settled on Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi's daring rescue of Palpatine, and improvised landing of an entire cruiser on Coruscant, when an iconic ship in its own right glides onto the scene. If you look closely at the scene depicting the Jedi heroes hopping off a transporter post-fiery landing, you'll spot Han Solo and Chewbacca's future mode of trusty transport in the Millennium Falcon, landing in the same locale at this very moment. Lovely stuff. Number 19, a foreshadowy goodbye. Clearly relishing the opportunity to hint at the inevitable fate fans already knew was on the horizon for the likes of Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi throughout his prequel set of features, George Lucas was at it again when it came time for The Apprentice to bid farewell to his master before they went their separate ways early on in Episode 3. With the troubled youngster being shrouded in shadow during this conversation with his patient brother-like figure, and the latter very much being illuminated by light, it's clear the Star Wars creator was alluding to what lay ahead for both characters down the road. Kenobi's goodbye old friend had long acted as a rather significant beat in its own right too, with those pretty much being the last words the Jedi Master would utter to his Padawan before he finally crossed over into the darkness. And the development of Kenobi later building on this fateful farewell with this heart-wrenching goodbye Darth, after their climactic rematch of the century in Obi-Wan Kenobi has only made this scene that little more impactful as time has gone by. Number 18, Obi-Wan Kenobi is quite the prolific pilot. It's not exactly a secret that Obi-Wan Kenobi isn't what you class as the most enthusiastic fighter pilot in the galaxy. However, a quick look at Kenobi's Jedi Starfighter of choice, the Etna II Actis class light interceptor, tells
tells the story of a pilot who is much more comfortable behind a steering wheel than you may have expected. As seen when the ship is very much parked aboard a separatist cruiser, Kenobi appears to have been keeping count of his numerous enemy kills whilst flying the Crimson Bird in space. And by looking at the shape of said ship markings, it appears the top rows consist of the number of droid tri-fighters Kenobi has dispatched, with the bottom being dedicated to the impressive number of CIS destroyers Providence class that he's helped take out. Number 17, it was the first ever PG-13 Star Wars movie. The visuals of everything from Anakin alluding to the cutting down of innocent children, to a severely melted Palpatine letting loose unlimited power, were enough to guarantee a first for George Lucas's galaxy far, far away. As it goes, Revenge of the Sith holds the honor of being the first ever Star Wars feature to head into theaters with a PG-13 certificate. Oddly enough though, neither of the aforementioned moments was said to have actually contributed towards the film being released under this rating, with it being the moment Anakin is burned to a crisp on Mustafar that was responsible for the eventual PG-13 decision. Number 16, a familiar cyborg cough. Ever wondered what goes into bringing the disturbing splutters of a deadly cyborg to life on the big screen? Well, it turns out that all you need is a once-in-a-generation movie maker with a bad chest infection and a microphone. With George Lucas himself suffering from bronchitis at the time of shooting and creating the robotic separatist general, the creator decided that his chesty cough wouldn't feel out of place, tumbling out of General Grievous' artificial body over the course of the flick. So every time you hear Grievous let loose one of his notable throat bursts in the flick, you're actually taking taking in the coughs of the creator himself after choosing to head into work under the weather. What a hero. Number 15, the Death Star nods. After being spotted in the background on Geonosis during Attack of the Clones, Chief Palpatine's ominous plans to forge the galaxy's most terrifying superweapon were once again on show during Revenge of the Sith within the secret Sith's office. And while the sight of Palps having a quick scan of his Death Star plans via red hologram, because why would a Sith in hiding use the blue alternative A? It was pretty tough to miss in episode 3. Three. There's every chance you overlook the fact that Death Star makes its presence known in his office decor too. As Anakin enters the space to converse with his future master, you'll see the two tables sandwiching him both boasting what appears to be the image of the eventual space station. Number 14, more Lucas family cameos. George Lucas doesn't half enjoy stuffing his family into his flicks under many a different alien disguise. Revenge of the Sith was no different, with Katie Lucas rounding off her trilogy of cameo appearances by showing up as chi equal Papanoida at the opera Anakin and Palpatine take in during the feature, and Jet Lucas returning as Padawan Jedi Zet Jukasa before getting gunned down by clones in front of Bail Organa. Only this time, instead of leaving all the fun to his youngsters, George himself got in on the action, beside his daughter as Baron Neoluwiski Papanoida, living his best intergalactic life whilst painted in blue during the aforementioned opera scene. Number 13, a few lightsaber mishaps. With the sheer amount of attention being paid to ensuring the state of the art visual effects were on point, and the story being told was one able to grip and captivate the masses for years to come. A few unfortunate mistakes elsewhere were always likely to wiggle into the episode 3 end product. Most notably, on two separate occasions, it appears the person in charge with continuity and all props on set dropped the ball a touch when it came to a thrilling lightsaber duel. First up, when Palpatine is seen battling away with Mace Windu and a number of other Jedi Masters, upon being uncovered as the Dark Lord of the Sith, the diabolical villain's lightsaber switches from his own distinct variation of the weapon to Anakin Skywalker's unmistakable hilt. This was likely due to the fact a scene depicting Pops taking up Anakin's weapon in the battle was later changed up, but the shot in question was still left in the end product. Elsewhere, as Anakin and Obi-Wan duel on Mustafar, another bizarre saber swap goes down as the former attempts to impale the latter with his own blade, before it then appearing to be Skywalker's weapon doing the attempted scorching. How weird. Number 12, a clone trooper by boxing a battle droid. Let it be known that there are more than a few ways to pick off a battle droid in the heat of battle. If you slow down the action a touch as Obi-Wan hops on his trusty space lizard to chase after General Grievous on Utapau, a sequence showing off a CGI clone trooper boxing the stuffing out of a battle droid can be seen going down within the chaotic locale. Turns out some of these Django copies had the eye of the tiger too. Number 11, Qui-Gon and Anakin share a funeral theme. Music has always acted as a seriously powerful tool in the crafting of many a Star Wars story, with George Lucas regularly using motifs as a way of foreshadowing a dark face 
wait for a set of characters. That was definitely the case when it came to the long-awaited introduction of Darth Vader in his final cyborg form late in the day. With a rather familiar piece of music alluding to a conclusion Obi-Wan Kenobi was having trouble coming to terms with. With the same music used during the cremation of Master Qui-Gon Jinn being present in the scene involving Vader going on a mad one after hearing of his beloved Padme Amidala being supposedly killed by his hand, Lucas seems to be musically hinting at Anakin being very much dead and gone in this moment, much like Jin was in The Phantom Menace. How deep. Number 10, a deliberately uncomfortable Vader suit. There's actually a very good reason Hayden Christensen resembled a toddler figuring out how to execute his very first steps during the closing stages of Revenge of the Sith. In an effort to showcase the fact that Anakin Skywalker was still coming to terms with his brand new way of being, Lucas went out of his way to make the iconic suit deliberately top-heavy by doing things like making the legendary helmet particularly weighty. And this very much helped give off the impression that Skywalker wasn't too accustomed to his new suit in the debuting of his new look. Number 9, Hayden Christensen packed on the weight for Anakin. Speaking of Hayden Christensen being put through the ringer when artificially breathing some life into Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader in Avenger the Sith. It wasn't simply a case of the disturbed Jedi actor rocking back up to set in the same physical form he had for Attack of the Clones when the time came to shoot this prequel closer. With Lucas wanting Christensen to resemble more of an intimidating force throughout the third episode, the actor was tasked with piling on some pounds and bulking up for his return. And after putting away a reported six meals a day in the lead up to shooting, Hayden was said to have piled on a whopping 24 pounds by the time he hulked up on the big screen in 2005. It often goes overlooked just how jacked Christensen genuinely got for this final prequel showing, and this shift from £160 to £185 no doubt aided him during those aforementioned heavy Vader sequences too. Number 8, more visual effects were shot than any other prequel. George Lucas most definitely doubled down on his love of all things computer generated when it came to blasting his prequel adventures into hyperspace. And while The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones were clearly not lacking in the CGI and VFX department, coming in with a jaw-dropping 1,950 and 2,200 visual effects shots on screen respectively, Revenge of the Sith took things to another level entirely in 2005. Boasting a frankly insane 2,400 visual effects shots throughout, it's often forgotten that Episode 3 easily sits as the most effect-heavy flick in Lucas's back catalogue. Absolutely blowing the more humble 360 uses of visual effects seen in A New Hope back in 1977 out of the VFX waters. And of According to visual effects supervisor John Knoll, even The Force Awakens only came in with just under 2,000 visual effects shots. Number 7, C-3PO's Frustrating Armor Despite not exactly stealing the show in his few fleeting appearances in the trilogy closer, Anthony Daniel's C-3PO actually played host to one of the most unexpected dilemmas the crew behind Revenge of the Sith had to overcome. That being the fact his unmistakable golden armor just so happened to reflect a set stuffed with vibrant green and blue screens. With this in mind, the VFX squad behind Episode 3 were forced to repaint all of 3PO's armor in post manually whenever he arrived on the scene to comfort Padme Amidala. This means every time you spot Daniels neurotically jolting around the scene within the flick, you're actually taking in some of the most subtle and soul-crushing CGI ever pumped into the galaxy. Number 6, Only 10 Men Wore Wookiee Suits The return of one of the most cherished furballs the original trilogy had to offer, only this time alongside the rest of his fiery race, brought with it some of the most inspired costume design of its time. All in all though, Chewbacca's re-emergence beside a fleet of other passionate and courageous Wookiees on Kashyyyk only ever saw a grand total of 10 dudes boasting the hairiest torso in the galaxy throughout shooting. So how was George Lucas able to successfully build one of the most ferocious armies ever to charge into battle within the Star Wars universe? Well, yeah, you guessed it. After he'd thrown this lucky 10 souls into their Wookiee getup, Lucas and his VFX team were able to duplicate the growling figures in post-production. After repositioning the actors on multiple occasions during a number of takes, and adding them back into the shot at a later date to make it look like there were more Wookiees present. You can never have too many, can you? Number 5, the second highest grossing movie of 2005 worldwide. For the most part, it's usually safe to assume that if a year is boasting a brand new release from one of the biggest and most loved franchises ever to be unleashed on a movie theatre, said 12-month period won't likely see any other flick surpass its overall box office haul. And while that's still 
still was clearly the case domestically when it came to Revenge of the Sith 2005 release. The same could not be said for its worldwide release. None other than those bumbling wizards and witches over in J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World were actually able to capture more attention and dollars than George Lucas's last prequel outing. With Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire beating out episodes 3, $868 million splash, with a staggering $895 million made at the worldwide box office. Either way, 2005 definitely marked the year of the Dark Lords. Number 4, The Death Count While it may be stating the obvious a touch, a film boasting the complete and utter massacring of the Jedi Order comes equipped with a frankly insane amount of death from start to finish. Just how many droids, Jedi, Sith, and other innocent civilians perished over the course of George Lucas's deadly conclusion to his prequel set of flicks though. Well, according to the list of deaths wiki, when factoring in every battle droid punched to pieces, Jedi Master blasted out of a window, and heartbroken mother who passed on in childbirth, a whopping 535,788 entities didn't make it out of this one alive. Half a million. In terms of who holds the unsettling honor of most kills in the feature, you won't be too shocked to discover Emperor Palpatine taking home the gold with his murdering of 9,901 via his Order 66 declaration. Number 3, the 501st Legion. And with said Order 66 culling in mind, those obedient stormtroopers seen cutting down many a youngling, padawan, and master within the Jedi Temple in Coruscant aren't just any old battalion of duplicate boys. The clone troopers decked out in undoubtedly awesome white and blue in this harrowing moment are none other than the 501st Legion, a group of soldiers commanded by Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano throughout the Clone Wars. Their on-screen debut in the Star Wars universe via Revenge of the Sith in the first place, though, was actually a way of saluting the real-life Vader's Fist fan organization dedicated to creating screen-accurate replicas of some of the galaxy's most legendary costumes. The organization, run entirely by volunteers, has also gone on to help raise millions for charities all over the world. So this cool canon nod to the folks fighting the good fight in the real world was a sweet touch from Lucas and Co. Number two, the tiny amount of antagonist screen time. Both Count Dooku and General Grievous played some rather vital parts in the final chapter of this pre-original trilogy set of tales, acting as physical pieces of foreshadowing towards Anakin Skywalker's eventual turn to the dark side. But away from Dooku representing a fallen Jedi, and Grievous foreshadowing the cyborg body heading Skywalker's way, you may be shocked to discover that these two despicable fiends were actually only present on screen for a grand total of eight minutes combined. Now sure, a large chunk of the narrative is taken up by Anakin's descent into Diaknus, a process accelerated by Palpatine's villainous on-screen presence for 24 minutes 45 seconds of course, but it's still interesting to note how big an impact both Revenge of the Sith antagonists had on proceedings, despite their evident lack of real time to shine. Number 1, Lightsaber Firsts and Onlys With so many sacred Jedi and Sith weapons being brandished over the feature's massive 140 minute runtime, it was only natural for a few Lightsaber Firsts to pop up on the prequel screen throughout Episode 3. First up, the scene depicts Mace Windu trying to arrest Sheev Palpatine with the help of a group of other Jedi Masters, holds the honor of being the first and only Star Wars movie scene to possess four different lightsaber colors on show during a showdown. Blue, green, red, and purple, naturally. And another first and only occurrence can be spotted during Obi-Wan and Anakin's fateful Mustafar melee, with this duel amidst the flames being the only ever Star Wars movie scene depicting two, in this case, blue blades of the same color going at it. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 7 The Force Awakens. Number 20, The Raftar Indiana Jones Connection. Episode 7 definitely boasted a ton of wonderful practical beings on everything from Jakku to Takadana, but The Force Awakens also contained its fair share of eye-catching CGI alien creations too. Perhaps the most memorable alongside Lupita Nyong'o's Maz Kanata popped up during the moments that followed the return of the iconic Han Solo and Chewbacca. And it's during that on-screen debut for the rolling balls of terror known as the Rattars aboard the Aravana that a rather subtle easter egg rumbled into your is without you likely realizing. According to one of the film's supervising sound editors, David Accord, that noise heard when one of the beasts roll after our favorite smuggling duo was actually the exact same one used for the boulder in Raiders of the Lost Ark as Indiana Jones tries not to get squished. How cool. Number 19, a Lin-Manuel Miranda piece amidst John Williams' score. 
The masterful John Williams was also back to produce yet another mesmerizing and magical score for this particular Star Wars adventure. Well, mostly. What you likely didn't catch is that Williams wasn't actually responsible for all of the music heard in this sequel starting epic. The legendary composer simply didn't fancy writing another cantina banger this time around. So after J.J. Abrams bumped into Lin-Manuel Miranda during a trip to see Hamilton, the mind behind that theater smash hit jokingly suggesting he could write the tune for them as Kanata's castle scene ultimately led to precisely that happening. That is very much another Miranda original going down in the background on Takadana, folks. Now, what is the best piece of Star Wars music ever? Is it this weird cantina tune or something else? Let me know in the comment section below. Number 18, the horned melon from a galaxy not that far away. Sticking in Maz Kanata's castle for these next few entries, as the gang sit down for a chat with the wise orange alien, a rather colourful bowl of alien treats can be seen. Only not every piece of delicious and bizarre looking food on show here was actually created by an art department to look like an edible item from a galaxy far, far away. The rather spiky piece of fruit here is a real-life Kiwano, aka a horned melon, with this particularly prickly one of your five a day found in Southern Africa. Number 17, Ray's Oddly Changing Bar Snack. Speaking of that spiky chunk of fruit, a soon-to-be Jedi can actually be found chowing down on that vibrant food during that very same discussion with Maz Kanata for a second. Seconds after a wide shot showing Rey clearly munching on one of those Kawano treats, a close-up of the scavenger actually reveals that she's now suddenly consuming something else entirely. Though easily missed amidst all the talk of Master Luke Skywalker and Han Solo trying to keep from getting involved in the fight, Rey's grub oddly switches from horned melon to a Fuji apple with some broccoli sticking out of it in the blink of an eye. Maybe Ray just puts away her meals at a freakishly quick pace, but it's more likely someone just didn't keep an eye on continuity in between takes. Number 16, the final Skywalker saga Wilhelm Scream. The days of the mighty Wilhelm Scream briefly bursting into your ears mid-galaxy far, far away movie finally came to an end during episode 7. As revealed in the lead up to the release of The Last Jedi, that film's supervising sound editor Matthew Wood declared it was time to let the Wilhelm past die, with that famous noise being retired from Star Wars features after The Force Awakens. Though you may not have realized during your first few watches of the 2015 tale, the familiar cry of pain let out by a First Order Stormtrooper as Finn and Poe last their way out of the finalizer Star Destroyer was the last Wilhelm you may ever hear in the big screen corner of this galaxy. Number 15, this was the first time a Stormtrooper went full melee. Awesome melee weapons have been popping up in this galaxy far, far away for decades. For the longest time, though, the most famous soldiers in the galaxy had never been given the chance to get in on the close-range combat action. But that all changed during the events of The Force Awakens. With a showdown between a First Order Stormtrooper and a certain traitor on Takadana, actually marking the first ever time a melee weapon was used by a white-armored trooper in a Star Wars film. It didn't work out so well for that First Order fighter, of course, but that Z. Six riot control baton wielding soldier and Finn will always have the honor of being the first people on screen to show off how skilled in melee combat these stormtroopers actually were. Number 14, General Hook's first name is never mentioned. Despite regularly appearing on screen throughout The Force Awakens, either squabbling with Kylo Ren or delivering one of the most excessively passionate speeches in Star Wars history, you probably never clocked that General Hux's full name is never once uttered on screen. In fact, his first name of Armitage was only revealed a few months later during the Aftermath Life Debt novel, with Hux being confirmed as the illegitimate son of Imperial Officer Brendel Hux. Hell, Donal Gleason, the talented star who brought Hux to life in the sequels, wasn't even aware of his character's first name until an interviewer informed him of the novel announcement during a chat. That's one way to find out. Number 13, Kylo Ren places his mask on some rather disturbing stuff. One seriously creepy detail was largely overlooked by just about every Force Awakens fan around the time of the film's release. A few months later though, right when Episode 7 was about to arrive on Blu-ray, J.J. Abrams opted to shed some light on precisely what was going down during a moment involving Kylo Ren and his Darth Vader tribute mask. 
The director would eventually note how the table of dust he dumped his mask on whilst interrogating Ray was actually a table full of the ashes of his victims. Lovely. That table suddenly disappears in the next shot, however, with Abrams eventually revealing that this moment originally went down much earlier in the movie during the scene involving Ren talking to his grandfather's melted mask. They soon realized the moment worked better with the one-time Ben Solo keeping his mask on instead, but Abrams felt this ashes slam was too damn cool to cut, so he simply threw it into the Ray conversation. Number 12. Some more stormtroopers think they may be splitting up. While things like Finn switching on of the familiar hollow chest table and discovering of Luke's old training drone on the Millennium Falcon were easily spotted delights, there was actually a much more subtle OG trilogy salute that went over most people's heads. As First Order Stormtroopers search for Han Solo, Chewbacca, Rey and Finn on Starkiller Base, a group of soldiers can be heard saying, we think they may be splitting up. And you'll never guess what another set of Imperial Stormtroopers said in exactly the same way all the way back in 1977 as Han, Chewie, Luke and Leia attempted to get off the Death Star. Looks like the story in general wasn't the only thing lifted from A New Hope, eh? Number 11, Conan O'Brien's Jub Jub Request Speaking of verbal easter eggs you almost certainly didn't catch during your first few viewings of this long-awaited return to the galaxy far, far away, none other than Conan O'Brien was actually responsible for this strange Star Wars occurrence. During an interview between the pair before The Force Awakens began filming back in 2013, J.J. Abrams promised the host that he'd sneak the words Jub Jub into his Star Wars movie, with Conan doing that very same thing on numerous occasions during his time working on The Simpsons in the past. And sure enough, the director kept his word. Listen closely as Ray manages to free BB-8 from a scavenger by the name of Tito, and you'll hear that diminutive alien let out what sounds exactly like the words jub jub as he wandered away from the pair. Number 10, Finn's number is a tribute to A New Hope. Returning to those harder to notice nods to the original trilogy during The Force Awakens, one time Stormtrooper Finn's first order number of FN2187 actually connected him to the galaxy's favorite princess. Those digits that followed the letters that inspired his new name were actually the very same ones called out by Han Solo in A New Hope when the gang discovered which cell Princess Leia was locked inside of on the Death Star. And that number popping up in episode 4 was also an intentional reference to Arthur Lipsitt's short film 2187, a flick that inspired the mind behind the galaxy far, far away George Lucas' eventual flick by the name of THX 1138. Number 9. All three new leading characters are introduced with a covered face. While Finn, Rey, and Kylo Ren all seemingly couldn't be any more unalike during the opening stages of this exciting dive back into the galaxy far, far away, they did all actually share something in common. You may have not registered it even after multiple watches of Episode 7, but all three of these fresh central figures showed up on screen for the first time, with their faces very much covered by various things. Finn obviously realized he was fighting on the wrong side while decked out in full Stormtrooper gear. Kylo Ren ominously showed up at that same Jakku location sporting his Darth Vader-esque mask, and Rey made her debut whilst hidden under a pair of goggles made from Stormtrooper helmet lenses and the rest of her scavenger garms. JJ sure loved his dramatic face reveals, didn't he? Number 8. License to remove these restraints one star who sadly wasn't given the chance to dramatically take off their helmet, however, just so happened to be the most famous secret agent on planet Earth. That's right, James Bond himself, Daniel Craig, covertly stopped by the Force Awakens set to finally make his secret debut in a franchise he absolutely adores. Now sure, Simon Pegg did technically let this one slip a few months before Episode 7's release when talking to the Sun, but there were still a great many Star Wars fans out there who didn't hear about the 007 actor's incoming cheek cameo, one that involved Rey Jedi mind-tricking a stormtrooper at Starkiller Base. That's unquestionably Craig being fooled into removing Rey's restraints though, with the actor eventually noting how walking around in that suit all day resulted in him losing the feeling in his bad guy blasting hands. Number 7. Harrison Ford uses a real-life response if you've ever had the pleasure of bumping into the legendary Harrison Ford on the street and asking him whether he is in fact the iconic star of Star Wars and Indiana Jones, then you likely spotted a rather brilliant detail hidden in The Force Awakens. The average person hasn't ever casually chatted with the great man, however, so there's a solid chance Han Solo's retort of I used to be when asked by Rey if he was the famous smuggler likely felt like little more than a typical Solo comeback. As revealed by Ford during a chat with Graham Norton a few years back, though, 
This is in fact exactly the same thing the star usually tells people in real life whenever they check to see if he is the same megastar they think he is. That's one way to confuse folks long enough to make a quick escape, I guess. Number 6. Familiar Looking Flags Returning to Maskanata's massive castle on Takadana, the entrance to this hive of criminals and travellers boasted a ton of colourful flags. But these were far more than just a way of adding a bit of brightness to the ancient building. Though it was just about impossible to catch absolutely every single symbol and crest while watching the moment Han, Chewie, Finn and Rey enter the castle in cinemas, when you finally do get a chance to briefly pause this entrance, some rather cool easter eggs become a little easier to spot. A mythosaur symbol last seen in the Mandalorian series and presence on Boba Fett's armor is there on one of these flags. Hondo Onaka's pirate gang symbol is here too, along with a variation of the 501st Legion logo. Number 5. Chewbacca finally pilots the Millennium Falcon Another easily missed first that went down during the most successful film of 2015, the most lovable furball in the galaxy finally found himself in a position folks had actually never seen him in before. In the wake of his longtime best bud Han Solo being tragically murdered by his own son within Starkiller Base, it was up to Chewbacca to rescue Rey and an injured Finn after the two had seen off Kylo Ren amidst the trees. And it was in this moment when Chewie was briefly seen sitting in the pilot seat of the Millennium Falcon for the very first time. With the icon Sonic Wookiee only ever co-piloting the Falcon alongside Han or Lando Calrissian up to that point. It's just a shame it took the death of his best mate for Chewie to finally get a chance to pilot the legendary light freighter. Number 4. Bill Hader and Ben Schwartz's Unusual Star Wars Appearance as already noted, there were a number of secret cameos on show in The Force Awakens, but perhaps the most obscure could be found whenever a certain rolling ball of joy was on screen. Though you probably wouldn't be able to guess from listening to the various bleeps and sounds that BBA makes throughout the flick, these were actually created with a little help from actors slash vocal consultants Bill Hader and Ben Schwartz. Schwartz was brought in to fill in the places where BB-8 would speak to various different characters with Hader then later operating a talk box that would be adjusted by a sound effects app on J.J. Abrams' iPad. Hader in particular also attempted to do a voice for the little astromech, but everyone soon agreed that this sounded a bit too human for the Resistance droid. Number 3. A Pink Droid with a Vitally Important Mission as that very same little astromech finally reunited with his pal Poe Dameron on the resistance based planet of Dakar, another easily overlooked droid can be seen rolling around in the background. This was far from just your average R2 unit though. The pink astromech by the name of R2KT was actually first created in the wake of 501st Legion founder Albin Johnson, discovering that his daughter Katie had been diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor in 2004, meaning she only had a few months to live. Katie specifically requested a droid to watch over her as her final wish. So the brilliant team over at R2 Builders built her a custom R2 unit, one that boasted pink accents and a name that sounded pretty close to her own. And Katie very much kept her droid by her side during her final days. With R2 Katie then going on to make appearances at various children's hospitals and raise a ton of money for charities in the years that followed before making a much deserved cameo appearance in episode 7. Number 2. The Trademark Abrams Kelvin Mention Moments after seemingly sneaking in a Conan O'Brien nod as Rey rescued BB-8 from Tido on Jakku, J.J. Abrams managed to add one more easily missed reference into his Star Wars picture. In pretty much every single Abrams feature to date, the director has found a way to add the word Kelvin into the script. The director's grandfather was called Harry Kelvin, and he was the person who first handed the future Force Awakens creator a camera. So as a tribute to him, everything from Super 8 to Star Trek has contained a little Kelvin tribute. And sure enough, Rey can be her telling BB-8 to stay off Kelvin Ridge on the desert planet. There's also a resistance pilot who goes by the name Niv Lek. And if you say that backwards, what do you get? Number 1. Some of Harrison Ford's hair was actually CGI. Rattars weren't the only thing created via CGI during the making of The Force Awakens, and iconic smugglers' locks were also given some rather unexpected digital adjustments too. That's according to J.J. Abrams' Blu-ray commentary, with the director eventually revealing how Han Solo and Chewbacca's first scene was actually a combination of stuff that was shot before and after Harrison Ford broke his leg on set. Ford's hair had grown in the time he spent away from set recovering, so rather than simply just ordering him to get a haircut, the team decided to digitally lengthen the hair he had in all the scenes he'd shot before his injury. 
With that in mind, have fun trying to catch those moments in Episode 7 when Ford is very much sporting CGI extensions the next time you fire up this sequel starting flick, folks. 20 things you somehow missed in Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Number 20 was the first Star Wars movie without a Wilhelm scream. Since making its Star Wars debut all the way back in 1977, the iconic Wilhelm scream had been present in absolutely every single big screen offering set in the galaxy far, far away. But you may not have realized that the days of the legendary sound first heard in 1951's Distant Drums appearing in this franchise sadly came to an end heading into Rogue One, with The Last Jedi supervising sound editor Matthew Wood telling ABC News that the series was moving away from the much-loved scream and letting the past die, as Kylo Ren put it. Despite seemingly being retired from the big screen corner of the galaxy though, that still didn't stop Robert Rodriguez from sneaking in a cheeky Wilhelm during the final episode of The Book of Boba Fett. You just can't keep a good Star Wars trope down. Number 19, a Clone Wars turbo tank is used to transport Jin. Ever wonder what happened to all that clone trooper kit in the wake of the Clone Wars coming to an end? Well, as easily missed during the early stages of Rogue One, it turns out some of the military vehicles in particular went from being used to transport clones into battle to carrying prisoners to various locations. An HCVW A9 turbo tank used by the Galactic Republic during the aforementioned battles is actually holding Jyn Erso in the moments before she's rescued by the Rebel Alliance on Wobani, with this on-screen appearance actually being its first in the Star Wars universe. The the tank would then go on to appear in the Bad Batch in the coming years, with similar HAVW A6 juggernauts also being present during the likes of Revenge of the Sith and the Clone Wars animated series. Simply put, the Empire didn't let these rolling Clone War relics go to waste. Number 18, a subtle Obi-Wan reference. And while on the subject of the planet, Jin Erso was imprisoned and forced to work for an Imperial labor camp on, the name Wobani actually subtly references one of the most iconic figures this galaxy has ever known. That's right, this planet's title is an anagram of none other than the bloke fond of greeting friends and foes with a cheeky hello there himself, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Unsurprisingly, this wasn't the only often overlooked Rogue One reference to the big screen Star Wars tales that came before it. Number 17, the homages to the original trilogy dialogue. Rogue One clearly boasts K2SO attempting to pay homage to Luke Skywalker's first utterance of the soon-to-be well-known phrase, I have a very bad feeling about this in A New Hope before getting unceremoniously cut off by Jin and Cassian. How rude! But while this original trilogy verbal tribute stuck out like a sore thumb, you may not have spotted a few other far less obvious tributes to some of the OG trilogy's awesome dialogue over the course of this Star Wars trilogy. Saw Gerrera did his best Admiral Akbar impression, letting out a swift it's a trap on Jeddah, and Andor also ordered K2SO to punch it, as the team fled the blasted planet. A nod to Han Solo and Lando's very same cool as all lines to Chewbacca in The Empire Strikes Back. Number 16, Edu was inspired by Alien. Gareth Edwards actually decided to look to another iconic piece of sci-fi when designing one of the many fascinating worlds on show in Rogue One. While it may not have been fully apparent when first taking in the titular crew's attempts to find Jin's father Galen on the planet Edu, it's pretty hard to unsee the similarities once you learn that the director was massively inspired by Alien's LV-426 during its creation. This moon, containing ominous rocks and a misty blue atmosphere, was one of the first places to be infested by the terrifying xenomorphs in the series. Series. Whereas in Rogue One, Edu was overrun with a slightly less frightening empire. Number 15, a New Hope footage was mixed into the action. As the Rebel Alliance finally saw into the action above Scarif late on, the various squadron leaders report to Admiral Radis. And it's here when a rather incredible and potentially missed piece of movie-making magic seamlessly drops into the sequence. The red and yellow leaders seen here by the name of Garvin Drace and John Vander, respectively, were very much played by the same actors who brought these characters to life in the Battle of Yavin seen in A New Hope. This all came about when Edwards went for a tour around Skywalker Ranch, with the director stumbling on a bunch of not fully digitalized film from the first Star Wars flick all those years ago. The unused episode 4 dialogue spoken by Drew Henley and Angus McKeans was then worked into the script, and the two OG trilogy faces were sensationally inserted into the cockpit seen in Rogue One by the magicians at ILM. Number 14, Some Familiar Cantina Faces 
Similarly to an unfortunate Luke Skywalker back in Moss Eisley's cantina during the events of A New Hope, Jin actually comes into contact with creepy cosmetic surgeon Dr. Cornelius Everzan and his aqualish pal Ponda Baba on the streets of Jeddah City. It's a brief collision, and Andor swiftly extinguishes any potential conflict before many folks even properly realised exactly who had been bumped into by Urso. But that is very much Baba and Everzan up to no good in the Holy City. What sort of criminal activity, you ask? Well... Number 13, one of the most disturbing characters in Star Wars history briefly appears. Far from just being a pair of drunken thugs looking for a fight in local watering holes, Dr. Cornelius Everzan and his pal Ponda Baba were responsible for one of the most horrifying creations ever to walk across a Star Wars surface. After already experimenting on a number of living beings whilst working for Crimson Dawn's Dryden Voss, stripping them of their personalities and transforming them into subservient slaves via cybernetic technology, Dr. Everzan and Baba were at it again in Jeddah City later down the road. This time, Everzan had been taking injured victims of the local insurgency and once again turning them into more disturbing, decraniated creations, selling them off to act as servants for the rest of their days. And in a blink and you'll miss it cameo of sorts, one of the these poor souls was actually briefly visible just as Saw Gerrera's partisans targeted the Imperials occupying the Holy City in Rogue One. Number 12, we see you, Blue Milk. After first being poured into the galaxy within the Lars family homestead during Episode 4, Blue Bantha Milk has made a habit of showing up in everything from prequel entries to Star Wars animated series over the last few decades. It even managed to sneakily wiggle into the opening stages of this Star Wars story too. With so much drama going on within the Urso household as director Krennic suddenly decided to drop in for a surprise visit, it's easy to miss the big old jug of the blue stuff on the dining table just as a panicked Lyra gets in contact with Saw Gerrera. Number 11, Red 5 not surviving sets the stage for an iconic figure to take their place. In Episode 4, Luke Skywalker eventually joins the Rebel Alliance's Red Squadron as the heroes look to take out the Empire's Death Star. The lad who ultimately helped bring an end to the Galactic Empire famously took up the call sign of Red 5, of course, and in a development that some fail to catch during a first viewing, the Star Wars story before A New Hope actually shows why that position was available. Not long after calling out his number and asking for assistance, a TIE fighter blasts Pedrin Gaul to smithereens above Scarif. This confirmed that Luke took the call sign of a brave pilot who was gunned down trying to help Jin and Co steal the super weapon plans that would aid the next Red 5 in taking out the Death Star in the not too distant future. Number 10, some of the trailer's best shots didn't make it into the movie. Gareth Edwards' flick grabs you by the scruff of your neck and refuses to let go for a gripping two hours. And that's largely why many didn't realise a number of the brilliant shots seen in Rogue One's trailers hadn't actually made it into the finished cut a good few hours after they witnessed Darth Vader butcher a corridor full of rebels. Everything from scenes showing off a bald Saw Gerrera to a damn TIE fighter suddenly greeting Jin high above the surface of Scarif was surprisingly nowhere to be found in the finished flick despite being present in trailers and teaser footage. Edwards would also later explain that the brilliant shot of Felicity Jones' Jin being gradually lit up whilst dressed in Imperial disguise during a teaser was actually little more than a product of the crew's daily indie hour, a time when the team could play about and shoot whatever they wanted. The director spotted someone flicking on the lights as Jones was walking to film her next shot and felt it was too wonderful a visual to waste. They had absolutely no clue how to fit it into the picture, but it worked a treat as the the teaser's memorable closing shot. Number 9, the first live-action Star Wars movie without an opening crawl. In an unprecedented but easily overlooked move at the time, this spin-off actually became the first film in the franchise's history not to begin with some traditional yellow words tumbling to the sound of John Williams' magnificent main theme. Now, Rogue One did still boast the iconic long time ago silent opening shot, but despite writer Gary Witter actually creating one for Edward's Star Wars story, a piece of text that remarkably contained the exact number of words as Episode 4's, the call was ultimately made to keep this standalone entry crawling. Number 8, Gareth Edwards' crew snuck some monsters into Saw Gerrera's cave. Before stepping into the worlds of Star Wars, Gareth Edwards spent a bit of time dealing with big screen monsters, directing both 2014's Godzilla reboot and the sci-fi horror known as Monsters. So as a way of cheekily saluting the director's history of working with various giant creatures on screen, the Rogue One crew decided to throw a few monster easter eggs into Saw Gerrera's cave. Edwards had no clue, and actually only first spotted one of the numerous cave paintings of the likes of Godzilla, the Mutos, and creatures from monsters in the middle of 
of a take. Hell, even the mind behind this flick initially missed these rather sneaky, monstrous Easter eggs, folks. Number 7. Sam Witwer's ongoing T-15 gag on top of being the voice behind the legendary Maul in the likes of the Clone Wars and Rebels animated series, Sam Witwer has also secretly made his presence felt in a number of other Star Wars projects. In fact, according to the actor himself when speaking at Star Wars Celebration 2022, Witwer actually went out of his way to drop an incredibly easy to miss ongoing gag into this galaxy far, far away in Rogue One. After hearing the stormtroopers on the Death Star talking about a BT-16 in A New Hope, Witwer opted to add another reference to this this sort of tech in the prequel story. Listen closely as a pair of troopers wander around Scarif, and you'll hear Whitwer mentioning how the T-15s have been marked obsolete. And once you catch that, go and search for the many other subtle Stormtrooper T-conversations in the likes of The Rise of Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Number 6. The Nod to George Lucas's Original Force Line Many different variations of Star Wars' legendary May the Force Be With You line have been uttered by everyone from Jedi Masters to defiant rebel forces throughout the franchise's history. But there was actually a time when this well-known phrase looked a little different, with George Lucas actually opting for May the Force of Others Be With You in earlier drafts of the first Star Wars. So, as a hiding in plain sight reference to that alternate reality where this OG version of the line showed up all over the galaxy, the blind guardian of the wills known as Chirrut Imwe can we heard greeting folks in Jeddah City with that early draft force line instead. Number 5. The Darksaber Tease Easily one of the most important and unique weapons used by many a Mandalorian and Force wielder in the Star Wars universe, the Darksaber had been making a mark on the galaxy long before it showed up in The Mandalorian a few years ago. And in a throwaway reference to this ancient blade being very much at the forefront of the Empire's mind in particular at the time of Rogue One, this weapon was actually alluded to during Jin and Cassian's search for the Death Star plans. As the two are flicking through the Imperial data files on Scarif, Jin confirms the presence of a Black Saber file. This quick reference seemingly hinted at the Empire's interest in the unmistakable lightsaber, sometime before it was revealed that Imperial Warlord Moff Gideon had eventually taken it from Bo-Katan Kryze during the Great Purge of Mandalore. Number 4. The Ghost Crew Cameos Star Wars Rebels' Harrison Dilla is finally set to make her live-action debut in this year's Ahsoka series. But did you know that Twilight Captain of the Ghost Crew actually briefly made her presence felt during the events of Rogue One too? Whilst on Yavin 4, a General Syndulla is told to report to the briefing room over the Tannoy, as Jin storms off from a council who refused to risk it all to get their hands on the Empire's Death Star plans. And that isn't the only easily missed Rebels cameo on show in the flick, with the ghost ship itself being present in the Yavin hangar and during the Battle of Scarif. Also, the mischievous astromech known as Chopper scooted on by for a spell, rolling across the screen as news of the Rogue One group taking a trip to Scarif made its way to the Rebel base. Number 3. Guerrera's crew are playing analog Dejeric Jumping back to Saw Gerrera's cave base of operations on Jeddah now, and to the unexpected return of one of the oddest games in the galaxy. Just after Cassian, Chirrut, Imwe, and Baze Malbus are dumped into a cell within the Partisan headquarters, a number of said Gerrera allies can be seen having a laugh playing an analog version of Dejeric. Said game, one that usually involves two people battling one another with creatures on a board, debuted all the way back in 1977, with a hologram version of the bizarre pastime first being played by R2-D2 and a petulant Chewbacca on the Millennium Falcon during A New Hope. Number 2. Ryan Johnson's Cameo Trade None other than The Last Jedi director Ryan Johnson also found a way to secretly wiggle into the Rogue One action. As the Empire fire up their planet-zapping superlaser on the Death Star, the two blokes in charge of pulling the levers to make that possible were in fact played by both Johnson and producer Ram Bergman. The guys behind Episode 8 and Knives Out apparently chose those figures because they knew they simply could not be cut from the story, with their presence being vital if this Death Star was going to produce its big green blast of doom. And in return, Johnson only went and threw Gareth Edwards into The Last Jedi too. That's the Rogue One creator giving a Resistance Trooper a funny look after they bizarrely chose to taste Crate's salty surface. How weird. Number 1. Mustafar is the only location not identified with a title card. When landing on the various planets seen in Rogue One for the first time, each of said worlds is given a clear title card, which lets audiences know exactly where they're about to touch down on. Well, for the most part. 
Though you probably didn't spot it in the moment, there was actually a place that wasn't introduced via title card during the runtime. A rather fiery and familiar location by the name of Mustafa. Yep, the same place where Anakin got all crispy. This was all very much intentional, with writer Gary Witter noting that this was done to preserve the mystery of that location and not make it obvious that Darth Vader was about to rock up. Even with it being known beforehand that Vader was set to wreak havoc at some point in the flick, fans weren't sure when and where he would arrive. And thanks to the lack of titles here, his back to tank return amidst the flames of Mustafar was that little bit more impactful. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 8 The Last Jedi. Number 20, those falling bombs weren't actually CGI. The Last Jedi certainly came stuffed with its fair share of incredible CGI. However, one sequence you may have initially assumed was another jaw-dropping computer-generated moment of action was actually far more practical than you realised. As noted by Episode 8 Special Effects Supervisor Chris Corbold, the visual of rows of bombs dropping out of a resistance bomber early in the film was partly achieved by creating a legitimate 50-foot high set and releasing some very practical 16-inch prop bombs. Once they quote-unquote sort of went out the bottom and out sideways, CGI versions of the weapons then took over, as they travelled down towards the First Order Dreadnought below in the flick. But those bombs that initially fell past a brave Page Tico were very much there on the day of shooting. Now I've got a question for you, what's your favourite action sequence in Star Wars history? Let me know in the comment section right down below. Number 19, the Porgs and Lanays are related. Joining the lovable little Porgs on the ocean planet Acto, that Luke Skywalker had been hiding away on for years, the Lanays acted as the sacred Temple Island's caretakers, looking after the ancient structures found there. What you probably didn't spot during their few appearances on screen during Episode 8, though, is just how similar these beings were to the cute furballs being cooked by Chewbacca. It turns out that these two beings are actually related, with The Last Jedi the visual dictionary revealing that the Lanays are an evolved member of the seabird family that also contain the Porgs, with both avian creatures possessing a similar pair of legs that are pretty hard to unsee once you spot them. Number 18, Don't Join the slippery slicer known as DJ certainly made his presence felt in The Last Jedi during Finn and Rose's attempts to break into the Supremacy ship and shut down the tracker the First Order were using to chase down the Resistance. But he never actually explicitly revealed what those two letters stood for, though he did actually subtly hint at what his nickname really meant a few times during the runtime. The first clue this stuttering codebreaker offered up could be found on DJ's hat with a plate on that item of clothing actually containing the words don't join on it in Orabesh. And if you weren't able to spot that easily missed name hints during your many rewatches of DJ shockingly turning on our heroes, then listen closely to what the genius slicer told the two on the ship he stole from Cantonica. Live free, don't join was DJ's advice to the freedom fighters, a line that contained both the human's motto and Elias. Number 17, it's the only Skywalker saga movie not to feature a Skywalker in its closing scene. Ryan Johnson decided to end The Last Jedi with the inspiring shot of a young stable hand using the force to get his hands on a broom and looking out at the massive galaxy in front of him after hearing the tale of Luke Skywalker. This was actually a pretty significant moment in Star Wars movie history though. Episode 8's uplifting conclusion surprisingly marked the first and only time a Skywalker saga feature ended on a moment that didn't involve one of the members of that titular family. Wowzers. Number 16, the Han, Leia, and Luke hair connection. During the latter stages of The Last Jedi, the two Skywalker siblings share a sweet moment together before Luke heads out to confront Leia's son. Her perfect quip about how she changed her hair in this heartwarming exchange was something that Carrie Fisher herself actually came up with, because of course she did. But you likely didn't spot how this brilliant one-liner also subtly connected the central trio of the original trilogy. Jumping back a film to The Force Awakens, you'll never guess what the first words to fall out of Han Solo's mouth were when he came face to face with his former lover again. 
This famous smuggler noticed how the iconic princess had changed her hair, as the two reconnected on Takadana. So Leia, seemingly sensing that the other important fella in the general's life would similarly be quick to point out how she'd opted to alter her hairstyle, cheekily beats her brother Luke to the punch this time around. Number 15, the Hardware Wars reference. It wasn't just official Galaxy Far Far Away projects that were cleverly saluted during Episode 8, with Ryan Johnson also managing to fantastically chuck a reference to a little-known short film called Hardware Wars into his epic space opera. Only the biggest Star Wars superfans will likely have heard of Ernie Fuselius' 13-minute sci-fi parody, a short film that tells the story of Star Wars only with household devices. But Johnson was clearly a lover of that small slice of silly Star Wars fun, and the moment when what looks like a spacecraft landing somewhere is soon revealed to actually be an iron pressing a uniform during The Last Jedi was actually confirmed as an official Hardware Wars reference by the director. Number 14, BB-8 has a bad feeling. You can be forgiven for thinking that the iconic I have a bad feeling about this, or another variation of the phrase didn't actually pop up during The Last Jedi, as not a single human or alien creature uttered the statement on screen. But this Star Wars tradition did actually live on. Instead of giving that line to one of the main Resistance figures, or a Force-sensitive being in the film, Ryan Johnson decided to hand this running gag to none other than little BB-8 in the film's opening scene. Those worried bleeps the astro Mech lets out, before Poe Dameron adds a happy beeps here buddy come on, was actually a binary version of the often mimicked Star Wars line. Number 13, Luke's Episode 6 Blaster Scorch on his robotic hand. By the time fans were reunited with the son of Anakin on Act Toe in the sequel trilogy, his once artificial skin covered mitt had now become a prosthetic hand that looked similar to his father's during the prequels. And not only that, this cybernetic right paw actually possessed an easily overlooked scorch mark, seen when Rey hands Anakin's lightsaber back to Luke early on in Episode 8. This was a bit of damage that was done 30 years earlier during Return of the Jedi. That's right, this is the exact same hole that was created by someone on Jabba's sail barge when a blaster was fired at the legendary Jedi in Episode 6. Number 12, Kylo and Leia's moment contains a nod to The Empire Strikes Back. Luke's still very much scarred metal hand wasn't the only nod to the original trilogy in this sequel episode either. Ryan Johnson also elegantly referenced an episode 5 moment between a parent and their child during Leia and Kylo Ren's Force connection in The Last Jedi. Watch closely as the general appears to connect to Ren through the Force just before the former is blasted out of the Radus, and you'll notice that the frame dissolves as the shot moves from one of Leia to her boy and back again. That's exactly the same thing that went down back when Darth Vader communicated with his own son Luke through the Force in The Empire Strikes Back too. And Johnson eventually confirmed in the film's director's commentary that this familiar dissolving frame was an entirely intentional homage to the other Skywalkers' shared telepathic moment in Episode 5. Number 11, The Holdo Maneuver Foreshadowing not long after that aforementioned moment when Leia was suddenly fired out into space by Kylo Ren's wingmen, the Force-sensitive daughter of Anakin Skywalker remarkably floated her way back to the Radus. Whether you were one of the folks who were left scratching their head at Organa's ability to survive in space, or were celebrating the galaxy's favorite princess finally showing off just how strong with the Force she really was though, either way there's a good chance you completely missed a genius bit of foreshadowing during this shocking return. As Leia makes her way through the destroyed bridge, she passes right through a hologram of Snoke's supremacy dreadnought splitting it right in two. You know, just like the Radus itself would before the end of the flick, when Vice Admiral Amalyn Holdo sacrificed herself for the Resistance by pulling off one hell of a hyperspace maneuver. Number 10, a flagship cruiser named after a Rogue One Admiral. And while on the subject of the ship that helped take down Supreme Leader Snoke's flagship and a bunch of other First Order Star Destroyers, you possibly may not have clocked the fact that this Resistance cruiser was actually named after another rather heroic rebel. Remember when the Rebel Alliance collided with the Empire over Scarif in Rogue One, a Star Wars story? You should because it was bloody amazing. Well, that Mon Calamari Admiral who received the Death Star plans from the likes of Jin Erso and Cassian Andor before his own Profundity cruiser was eventually destroyed by Darth Vader's Devastator Star Destroyer actually went by the name of Radus. 
So with fellow Mon Calamari legend Jill Akbar feeling it would be a great way to honor the rebel leader who sacrificed himself for the cause, the call was eventually made to name one of the New Republic's cruisers after the Valiant Admiral when the Resistance began using it. Number 9. Mark Hamill's Other Role not only did the mighty Mark Hamill score top billing during his proper return to the franchise in Episode 8, no, I'm not counting Episode 7, you silly gooses, but he also managed to surprisingly land not one, but two parts in The Last Jedi. Listen closely when BB-8 is ambushed by a little alien gambler in Canto Bight, and you'll perhaps recognize the creature's grumbles and growls. That's because Hamill's voice was very much the one coming out of Dobu Skay's mouth. Oh, and that character's name was an anagram of the name of the film's editor, Bob Dusky. The legendary voice actor actually went out of his way to ask his director for an additional CGI role in the movie. And this wasn't simply a case of sitting in a recording booth and pretending to be the amphibian. Hamill actually had to don a full motion capture suit and act opposite a giant BB-8 to play the diminutive menace. Number 8. Luke's X-Wing was used to build his hut with most fans reeling from the visual of Luke Skywalker tossing his lightsaber away like an unwanted Christmas present, a lot of people missed the fact that this legend's home actually contained a pretty familiar element. When Rey bangs on Luke's hut and asks the iconic Force user to help her and the Resistance, the thing she hammers on wasn't actually your typical door. According to another entry in The Last Jedi's Visual Dictionary, Skywalker's door was actually made of salvaged S-foil from his X-Wing that would eventually be seen sitting underwater after Luke committed to shutting himself off from the galaxy for good. Number 7. Laura Dern's Pew it's been well documented how a number of the galaxy's greatest Jedi actors have often found it pretty tough to get through a take without making a few of their own lightsaber sound effects. Well, wouldn't you? But did you spot that time Laura Dern let slip her very own giddy pew whilst using a blaster during The Last Jedi? If not, then keep an eye on the moment the Vice Admiral Holdo Thespian stuns the Resistance members helping a mutinous Poe Dameron. As revealed by Ryan Johnson during the aforementioned director's commentary, Dern simply could not help herself in the moment and repeatedly unleashed a few pew pew noises when pulling the trigger on her blaster, with one even making it into the film during that shootout. Number 6. Poe's Special Necklace During one of the many times the aforementioned Maverick pilot Poe Dameron clashes with Vice Admiral Holdo in Episode 8, a largely overlooked piece of jewelry slips out of the Resistance fighter's shirt for a moment. And far from being little more than a meaningless bit of Dameron bling, that reliable The Last Jedi Visual Dictionary book once again revealed that there was more to this item than meets the eye. The necklace Dameron wears throughout the movie actually holds his mother's wedding ring on it. And do you know why this rebellious Resistance pilot keeps his late mom Shara Bey's ring with him at all times? because he's patiently keeping it close for the moment when he finally finds the right partner to give it to one day. How bloody sweet. Number 5. The Footstep Hints at Luke Being a Projection After defiantly facing down the entire First Order with a laser sword, it's eventually astonishingly revealed that Luke Skywalker wasn't actually on crate fighting Kylo Ren at all. The powerful Jedi Master had unbelievably projected his image halfway across the galaxy in order to buy the Resistance enough time to escape the planet. What a guy! But there was actually a number of hints that pointed to this not being an in-the-flesh Luke Skywalker during their showdown. On top of the slightly more obvious fact he was boasting a Skywalker lightsaber that had just been destroyed by Rey and Kylo Ren, and a much younger looking beard and head of hair than we'd seen him sporting earlier in the film, the Jedi's footsteps also subtly give away the fact this was all an illusion. His former apprentice can be seen ripping up the salt on Crate in their duel, whereas Luke doesn't leave a single footprint on the planet's surface. A fact that definitely lets the audience know this wasn't really the in-person Skywalker they were looking for. Number 4. Director, Big Name Actor and Dog Cameos you probably didn't notice that the moment the surface of Crate is revealed to be covered in salt actually came with a rather fun cameo appearance too. Rogue One director Gareth Edwards can be spotted giving his fellow Resistance soldier a rather hilariously dirty look after the lad tastes the salty ground in the flick. 
And this wasn't the only small and potentially unnoticed cameo The Last Jedi had to offer. The star of Ryan Johnson's Looper, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, shows up as the voice of Slow and Low in Canto Bite. Tom Hardy, Prince William, and Harry all appeared as stormtroopers in a deleted scene. Gary Barlow cameoed as a resistance soldier during that same crate trenches moment already mentioned. And even Carrie Fisher's dog ended up getting a cameo of sorts, with a chefy known as Augury being inspired by the late star's pet. Number 3. Hyperspace Tracking Had Been In Development For Years Cameo star Gareth Edwards' Rogue One A Star Wars Story offered a wonderful and ridiculously subtle clue at what was to come in The Last Jedi. As Jyn Erso and Cassian Andor search for the Death Star plans within the Imperial Data Bank on Scarif, the former reels off a number of the projects the Empire had clearly been working on 30 years before the First Order spent much of The Last Jedi tracking the Resistance through hyperspace. And surprise, surprise, Erso actually utters the name of one file that reads hyperspace tracking, proving that the enemy had actually been working on this seemingly impossible technology for decades. So while some Star Wars fans may have understandably felt like this rather convenient piece of tech had bizarrely come out of nowhere in Episode 8, it was actually hinted at during a Star Wars story that came out a whole year earlier. Number 2. Kylo Ren's Moving Scar that facial scar the fallen Ben Solo was given on Starkiller Base went through a bit of an unexpected and largely ignored change by the time The Last Jedi landed on screens. According to Ryan Johnson himself, he decided that Kylo's scar needed to be adjusted a touch. And the reason behind this subtle shift from the mark crossing over his nose to moving further across his face instead was simple. The director felt a scar going up the bridge of his nose looked goofy. Fair enough. Though most of the planet was too distracted by the character going full Ben Swolo during his forced conversation with Rey to catch this slight scar change. Number 1. A shot was framed as a callback to an Anakin Skywalker moment. Not long after being embarrassed by his former master, the ever-changing scar boasting Kylo Ren struts into the Resistance base, searching for what's left of the rebel scum. However, what you possibly didn't catch here was another fascinating tribute to a previous Skywalker saga film. Whilst chatting during the film's director's commentary, Johnson explained how this overhead shot of the grandson of Darth Vader walking into the base was a direct callback to a similar shot used by George Lucas during Revenge of the Sith. You know the one. Anakin Skywalker is marching into the Jedi Temple with the 501st Legion before he begins slaughtering many a youngling. Johnson simply loved that moment so much, he framed his own shot to look just like the outstanding Order 66 one in Episode 3 all those years ago. 20 Things You Somehow Missed in Solo A Star Wars Story Number 20. The Opening Wasn't Set in Space That's right, of the 11 live-action Star Wars movies to date, the scene which involves Han in his speeder coming back to Lady Proxima makes Solo the sole Star Wars movie not to begin in outer space. They don't call it Star Wars for nothing, you know. It is a small detail and one that doesn't particularly impact too much, it must be said, but it at least gives Solo something of a uniqueness even if just for how the whole spin-off tale begins. Number 19, Crimson Dawn was name-dropped early. Though the details are a little sketchy, thanks to a three-year time jump, Han's love goes from being trapped on Corellia to being one of Dryden Voss's most trusted advisors. The vicious leader of the Crimson Dawn was notoriously ruthless, as were the Groot themselves, and were on Kira's radar well before she ultimately joined them. As they were queuing to leave the planet, she warned Han of a life without the Empire's protection, and of the risk of being sold to either the Hutt Cartel or Crimson Dawn. Turns out the latter were a danger even without her leaving the planet, and that was telegraphed within the first 10 minutes of the movie. Number 18, The Pikes. The opening words of Solo, a Star Wars story, painted the picture of a lawless galaxy, and the likes of Crimson Dawn and the Huts were able to thrive in this environment. Then there were the Pikes, gangsters that controlled the spice mines on Kessel. Solo was the first time such characters were seen in live action in the Star Wars universe. Though they appeared numerous times through the Clone Wars, easily the biggest storyline that involved the Pikes was the mystery of the mind behind the creation of the clone army Jedi Master sifo death. None of this was touched on in Solo, of course, so it would be easy to miss just how big a damn deal the Pike Syndicate actually was. 
Number 17, Tobias Beckett's Disguise. As a smuggler, it's to be expected that Lando Calrissian would have his ways of avoiding being recognized. When infiltrating Jabba's palace in an effort to free Luke Skywalker from a date with the Sarlacc in Return of the Jedi, Lando of course suited up in a disguise that covered most of his handsome face. And in a lovely callback to the original trilogy, Tobias Beckett wore the exact same outfit during the heist on Kessel in Solo. Stored in the Millennium Falcon, it was again there for Lando all those years later. Number 16, Terras Cassie. In those three years separated from her beloved Han Solo, Kira was taken by Crimson Dawn and under the wing of their intimidating leader, Dryden Voss. And he went about training her as something of his second in command. This also entailed training in physical combat. Kira more than held her own during the fight on Kessel. And when asked what she was doing, she answered that Voss had taught her Terras Cassie. This is an incredibly deep cut reference to the gaming side of the Star Wars universe. Way back in 1997, when the Star Wars franchise consisted of just three movies, I know, what a world, LucasArts released Star Wars Masters of Terras Cassie on the PlayStation. The fighting game was notoriously bad, but was somehow remembered by the solo writers even all these years later. Number 15, a similar story to The Bad Batch. With the sequel trilogy and two anthology movies releasing within a five-year stretch, as well as almost countless Disney Plus series either releasing or in the works, it's almost expected that some of these stories will be somewhat similar. Though not identical, there are themes and threads throughout certain narratives within the Star Wars universe that are ridiculously alike. And what do you know, this just so happened to happen with Solo and The Bad Batch. In the glorious animated Bad Batch series, it was a tactical droid head that that the titular unit initially fought Trace and Rafa for, before handing it over to them voluntarily. While Han Solo battled Enfys for the valuable coaxium, almost all movie long before allowing her to leave with the hyperfuel as a means of the greater good. Simply put, the tale of episode 6 of The Bad Batch is eerily similar to this particular piece of Solo's story. Number 14, Anthony Daniels as Tack. C-3PO and R2-D2 have been involved in every Star Wars Skywalker saga movie, as well as Rogue One, though they were nowhere to be seen in Solo. This could have meant that C-3PO actor Anthony Daniels appeared in all but one Star Wars movie so far, but in truth, that just is not the case. It is a very small blink and you'll miss it role, and that's if you can recognize Daniels' actual face rather than his usual droid mug, but the actor does appear in Solo as well, meaning that all 11 movies so far have featured him in some way or another. The character Daniels played was called Tack, one of the slaves on Kessel who fought back after Han kickstarted a revolution on the planet. Number 13, Enfys Nest was a better Kali Morgenthau. Enfys Nest consistently hounded the crew's attempts to steal Coaxium in Solo, and was responsible for Han dumping the first lot, forcing them instead to heist raw Coaxium on Kessel. However, it was then confirmed that Enfys didn't want the hyperfuel for herself or to sell to the highest bidder. She genuinely wanted to make a difference against the Empire in the galaxy. Enfys was portrayed by Erin Kellyman, who three years later joined the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Kali Morgenthau in The Falcon and the Winter soldier. And the character's motivation is very similar to that of Enfys. Both characters were living outside of the law, trying to have some effect on a ruling body that wasn't treating them right. There are major similarities between both could-be heroes, if they went about things in a slightly different way. Only Enfys was far more successful. She actually did make some sort of difference, whereas Carly actively made things worse for herself. Number 12, Warwick Davis as Weasel. Despite playing the likes of Ewoks, aliens, and an animated character in Star Wars Rebels, Warwick Davis his face has rarely been in the spotlight. Solo is one of the rare times, however, that his recognizable features are not obscured. There was no name given to his character while on screen, though he is confirmed to have played Weasel as part of Emphasis' crew. It is reasonable to believe, then, that this must be connected to the only other time his face has been shown. Coming all the way back in The Phantom Menace when Davis was spotted watching the pod race. Does this mean that this too was Weasel? The way Star Wars is churning out content now and moving into the future, there will probably be a Weasel Disney Plus series to tell his story soon enough. Number 11, I know. There has always been something of a love-hate relationship shared between Han Solo and Lando Calrissian, and the two had that very same dynamic going all the way back to when they first met. Lando liked the cocky kid, but as with most people, it was far too easy for Han to get on their bad side. This was a result of his general attitude, his arrogance, and of course getting Lando and the Falcon involved in the Kessel heist in the first place. When they landed on Severine, the Falcon, Lando's pride and joy, was battered and bruised. And as he and Han looked upon the damage to his beloved ship, he told his new friend that he hated him. The two-word response echoed arguably Han Solo's most famous and most iconic dialogue from the entire original trilogy. I know. 
Number 10, Fair and Square. Now, it must be said that most fans would argue that they didn't need a backstory behind every single word Han Solo said in the original trilogy, but that's essentially what they got in Solo, all the way down to the exact words he used in a disagreement with Lando on Cloud City. The friends slash rivals had always disputed who the rightful owner of the Millennium Falcon was, with Han specifically telling Lando that he won it fair and square. But not just one game of Sabacc between the two was shown in the prequel, two were. The first, Lando cheated to win, but by the time of their rematch, the hero of the story had figured out how to get the better of his rival pal. This is why the words fair and square were so damn meaningful. When Lando first beat Han, it wasn't a fair game, so he made damn sure that the second one would be. Number 9, A Good Feeling you want more callbacks to famous references? Well, how about the movie taking one of the most famous Star Wars phrases and flipping it right on its head? Oh, hey! In the 10 other Star Wars movies, the phrase, I've got a bad feeling about this or some variation has been spoken. Then there is Solo. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the phrase would absolutely be uttered as Han himself said it way back in A New Hope. But instead, the iconic character took a different view of the situation. In fairness, in Solo, he was backing himself to navigate through a maelstrom that no other pilot possibly could. And he was right to have a good feeling about this one after all. What a positive pilot, eh? Number 8, Mandalorian Armor. Star Wars Easter eggs can often be hidden in plain sight, in the background of a conversation or action piece that draws the focus, such as the details of Dryden Voss's office, for example. In the middle of the room, there is a full set of Mandalorian armor on display, and though many won't have noticed, as soon as you know it's there, you start asking some questions. Why in particular would Dryden Voss have such armor on show? Well, what if it was a nod to arguably one of the more surprising reveals of the entire movie? Fans of the Clone Wars have known for some time that Darth Maul didn't die at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Not in The Phantom Menace, at least. But the majority of mainstream solo movie-watching audiences would have had no idea. Fans of the show also would remember that a big part of the Sith Lord's arc saw him complete a successful hostile takeover of Mandalore itself. Could this armor have been a nod to the man Voss answered to only? For those diehard fans who would really know what it could mean? Possibly. Number 7, A Dead Rebellion While on Kessel, the whole focus of the mission was to heist away enough raw coaxium to pay back Dryden Voss for the hyperfuel hand dumped to shake loose emphasis on his first mission with Tobias, Val, and Rio. However, it wouldn't have made for much of a story if it was this simple, right? The crew, in particular Han and Lando's droid L3, essentially sparked a mini-rebellion on the planet, as you do. However, while that is where the story ends for Kessel in Solo, as naturally the movie follows Han and Co once they leave the planet, there were are still things that were going to go down on that planet afterwards. Namely, this rebellion against the Pikes was quashed, and the planet continued on pretty much as it had done before, using slaves to mine spice. This is all but confirmed in the opening story of Star Wars Rebels, a show that is set after Solo in the timeline. Ezra's first mission with the crew is to help a group of Wookiee slaves escape from the Empire. But where are they being taken as slaves? That's right, Kessel. This would have been impossible had the uprising actually been successful, but instead Han and Co essentially left the planet behind just as they found it, albeit a few vials of coaxium lighter. Number 6, Dryden Voss's Scars for almost a decade, Paul Bettany has portrayed Vision in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's fair to assume that in that span he has become accustomed to the use of prosthetics while shooting for the Avengers movies. For Solo, based on the scars that are one of the key features of Dryden Voss's face, you'd be forgiven for assuming that this was a similar process. However, that's not quite true, as the actor who brought the character to life wasn't even aware the scars would be there until after shooting had wrapped. Instead, he simply found out about his character's true post-CGI appearance when Ron Howard sent him a picture after the the fact. Charming. Number 5, Bounty Hunters. Bounty hunting seems to be a rather legitimate profession throughout the Star Wars universe. And though they may be the most famous to do it, there are obviously far more than just the likes of the Fets and Din Djarin. And there were two somewhat familiar hired killers referenced throughout Solo as it goes. When deciding whether or not to welcome Han and Chewie into their crew, Val suggested to Tobias that they bring in Bosk instead. A very minor character in Empire Strikes Back, you're far more likely to recognize the bounty hunter's lizard aesthetic rather than his name. Another to be referenced is Aura Singh, a bounty hunter who ran a crew with Bosk, as well as a still young Boba Fett in The Clone Wars. 
Number 4, an Indiana Jones Easter egg. In a setting such as Dryden Voss's office, with so much going on in the background in terms of display, it would almost be criminal to have just one Easter egg, right? There are literally limitless Star Wars artifacts that could have been included, but Solo also opted for a detail from another franchise entirely. Harrison Ford had a career the likes of which few could hope to match, but there is no denying his two biggest and greatest roles. Both coming under the Lucasfilm banner, it made perfect sense to include a little nod to Harrison Ford's other iconic character in a film about Han Solo. The nod in question came when Beckett and Han first met Dryden Voss. With so much going on, you'd be forgiven for missing the golden idol from Raiders of the Lost Ark on the table behind them. That deserves a celebratory whip crack, I say. Number 3, Chewie Will Rip Your Arms Off of course, a prequel of this nature was always going to have strong connections to the movies it spun off from, but it genuinely seemed like every single hint to Han's backstory or dialogue between him and Lando was given even more context in this movie. This didn't stop with Han either, as of course alongside him was everyone's favourite Wookiee Chewbacca. There was even a callback to when Han's right-hand Wookiee first met C-3PO and R2-D2. Upon the Millennium Falcon in A New Hope, Chewie sat across the chessboard from R2-D2, who was roundly beating him. Han warned that his friend could pull an arm out of its socket if he lost. Later in Solo, a Star Wars story, during the heist of Kessel, Han and Chewie attack their would-be guards. In spite of the fact the man's uniform would have fit Han perfectly, the Wookiee tore both his arms from his body, sleeves included. Without too much effort, to be honest. Turns out Han wasn't joking when he warned C-3PO about losing a limb or two. Number 2, John Favreau as Rio. You could argue that no one has done more for Star Wars in recent years than John Favreau. However, even before his glorious Star Wars creations were released, Favreau played his part in Star Wars on screen rather than off it. His first Star Wars acting credit came when he voiced Pre Vizsla in The Clone Wars, fittingly a Mandalorian extremist and leader of Death Watch. In Solo, however, he played a much more light-hearted character who only appeared in a handful of scenes before being killed. When Han met Tobias Beckett, he joined a crew that also boasted Val and Rio, the latter being a CGI. Ardenian pilot. The thing is, John Favreau's voice is recognisable as the character, particularly to fans of the MCU, though not necessarily instantly, so he's easily missed during his brief appearance here. Number 1, Han Shot First In the Mos Eisley Cantina where Han first meets Luke and Obi-Wan in A New Hope, he is confronted by Greedo trying to collect payment owed to Jabba the Hutt. Of course, the discussion goes very wrong very quickly for Greedo, as he is shot dead by Han. As you likely know by now, in the original movie, Han shot Greedo first. While edits were later made to show Greedo trying to shoot Han to give more of a suggestion of self-defense, this proved quite controversial and unpopular with some fans, but has since been referenced as an to those unhappy few in Solo. After Han and Beckett double-cross each other a few times, they have a standoff, but before the latter has a chance to do anything, Han shoots him, eliminating any threat of the reverse happening. This is absolute and undeniable proof that Han would shoot first to save himself, without risking waiting to see what his adversary would do first. So take that, George, yeah. 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 9: The Rise of Skywalker. Number 20, that mysterious message could actually be heard on Fortnite. Within the opening few seconds of The Rise of Skywalker, fans were hilariously informed that the dead speak. As Episode 9's opening crawl explained how Emperor Palpatine had recently sent out a mysterious broadcast threatening revenge. However, the words of Zombie Palpatine uttered in this message were never actually heard. In the film, that is. If you weren't immersed in the world of Fortnite at the time of the movie's release, you probably missed the fact that Palpatine's sinister broadcast actually debuted during a December 14th event in the game dedicated to the incoming Star Wars feature. Sometimes it pays to play video games, you know. Number 19, it's a song! Star Wars lost a mighty hero during the events of The Last Jedi, with Admiral Jeel Akbar shockingly being blasted out of the Radus. However, his legacy actually lived on in The Rise of Skywalker. That Mon Calamari resistance fighter seen on the hero's Ajan Kloss base throughout Episode 9? That's none other than Jeel's own flesh and blood, Aftab Akbar, a character first seen in the Allegiance comic books. He was doing his daddy proud. Number 18, Ralph McQuarrie's concept art inspired thrones and locations. 
The late great conceptual designer Ralph McQuarrie was responsible for creating some of the most fascinating concept art in movie history. With many of those ideas heavily influencing the galaxy far, far away, fans know and adore today. And his exceptional work managed to find its way into the final Skywalker saga entry too. Palpatine's intimidating Sith throne on Exegol was evidently inspired by McQuarrie's unused concept art for the Emperor's throne in Return of the Jedi. As confirmed by Lucasfilm creative art manager Phil Sostak on X. Also, as noted by Lucasfilm story group member Pablo Hildago, the mirror spires on the planet Avexia Poe Dameron Lightspeed skips to early on in Episode 9 were influenced by some of the work seen in the illustrated Star Wars Universe book that contained a ton of Macquarie's fantastic art. Number 17, The Origins of Location Names the rise of Skywalker introduced Star Wars fans to the likes of the snowy Kajimi and another moon of Endor known as Kethbir. When it comes to that former location, you likely didn't spot that J.J. Abrams actually seemingly opted for that specific name as a nod to a real-world item. Abrams is quite the fan of a Japanese company known as Black Corporation, and they also produce a synthesizer that goes by the name of, you guessed it, Kajimi. The company even posted a photo of the director holding said item on their Instagram a few months before the film came out. Elsewhere, the location where Janna and the rest of her Stormtrooper pals mutinied and set island is actually an anagram of Staten Island, the birthplace of Episode 9 screenwriter Chris Terrio. Coincidence? I think not. Number 16, Lando Calrissian and Wedge Antilles record-setting returns after 36 years away. The Rise of Skywalker was the first time in over three decades both Billy D. Williams and Dennis Lawson appeared on screen as Lando Calrissian and Wedge Antilles, respectively. Though Lawson did actually lend his voice to the character for GameCube Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader game back in 2001. But with that not technically counting as a live-action slash on-screen performance from the OG trilogy Thespian, both Lawson and Williams' welcome comebacks to the galaxy far, far away ultimately set the record for the longest time between on-screen Star Wars appearances. With both of the original trilogy actors last appearing in The Return of the Jedi, a whopping 36 years before Episode 9 landed in theatres. Number 15, Rey was right about BB-8 doing the same thing she did. Not long after showing she possessed the ability to heal other living beings by transferring force energy from herself to a wounded Vexus, Rey tells her little astromech pal BB-8 that he would have no doubt done the same in that position. Far from being a throwaway compliment from the powerful force user though, this actually acts as a subtle piece of foreshadowing. When the gang eventually find themselves on Ochi's ship on Persana, the rolling hero bumps into another small droid. And after spotting that this diminutive bot was very much deactivated, BB-8 swiftly decided to pump some power into little Dio, voiced by J.J. Abrams in the flick, and bring him back to life. Proving that this resistance legend certainly would offer a bit of his own energy to heal slash fix someone when given the chance to. Rey knew her droids, dammit. Number 14, Ben Solo's facial scar disappears after he's healed. The Force Awakens ended with the fallen Ben Solo clearly getting slashed across the bridge of his nose by an unexpectedly powerful Rey on Starkiller Base. He got his ass whooped. This scar then bizarrely moves a few inches across his mug in The Last Jedi, due to Ryan Johnson feeling the wound looked a bit goofy where it originally was. But what you may not have caught during your first few watches of The Rise of Skywalker was the fact said facial scar disappears entirely after one rather important moment. When Rey repeats her aforementioned healing trick on the son of Leia Organa and Han Solo after stabbing him on Keth Beer, keep an eye on Ren's face. As Kylo Ren is gradually pulled back towards the light by his parents and the other half of the Dyad of the Force, the mark Rey put there in the first place gradually fades away during the recovery process and is absent for the rest of the film. Number 13, a few bad robots turn up in Babu Frick's workshop. Just before the protocol pal C-3PO has his memory wiped in Babu Frick's workshop, 
In order to successfully translate the Sith language pointing the team in the direction of the all-important Wayfinder, a B-1 battle droid can be found sitting over the golden figure's shoulder. And that wasn't the only bad robot in Frick's place of work either. According to the film's creature effect supervisor Neil Scanlon, an actual little red droid version of the mascot for Abrams' bad robot production company was also hanging out somewhere in the area. You just never know who you're going to bump into in Frick's droid wonderland. Number 12. A New Hope Starfield Makes an Appearance Rey had just been well and truly drained by her despicable grandfather. That did not sound as weird in my head. However, just as Darth Sidious was in the middle of ripping apart the Resistance fleet with his ridiculously powerful Force Lightning Storm, his own flesh and blood began to ask the Jedi of the past to give her a hand in taking out the revived Emperor. And it was in this moment when a Starfield could be seen as Rey heard the many different helpful voices. But this wasn't just any old collection of stars, folks. It was eventually confirmed by visual effects supervisor Patrick Tubuck that this is actually the same Starfield fans first saw all the way back in 1977, when the opening crawl of the first Star Wars had reached its end. How cool is that? Number 11. Some Famous Jedi Help Rey Take Down Palpatine and while on the subject of Rey calling on the Jedi of the past to help her whoop Palpatine's wrinkly ass, the collection of famous Jedi faces J.J. Abrams managed to assemble for this awesome voiceover ensemble is more impressive than you initially may have realized. Along with the awesome return of the likes of Mark Hamill and Hayden Christensen as Luke and Anakin Skywalker respectively, deep breath. Liam Neeson as Qui-Gon Jinn, Sir Alec Guinness and Hugh McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi, Ashley Eckstein as Ahsoka Tano, Freddie Prince Jr. as Kanan Jarrus, Olivia Diabo as Luminara Unduli, Jennifer Hale as Ayla Secura, Samuel L. Jackson as Mace Windu, Angelique Perrine as Adi Galia, and last but certainly not least, Frank Oz as Yoda all show up when Daisy Ridley's Rey needs them the most. This was pretty much Star Wars version of a muddy Chris Evans bringing together Earth's mightiest heroes to take down a nutsack-chinned Mad Titan. Number 10. Rey's new lightsaber was built from her quarterstaff. After using the lightsabers of various Skywalkers during the Skywalker saga, Rey finally switched on her own personal Jedi weapon just before the Rise of Skywalker concluded. And there's a solid chance you were too blinded by the fact Rey decided to go for a fresh yellow blade for her weapon of choice, complete with a yellow kyber crystal, to spot exactly what that lightsaber was made of. Well, as confirmed by visual effects production supervisor Roger Geert, the hilt of the laser sword was actually crafted from bits of the quarter staff she'd been using since episode 7. So she'll always carry a piece of her Jakku past with her whenever she's slicing her way out of trouble in the years post Rise of Skywalker. Number 9. C-3PO's last line in the saga was the same as his first. In another cute nod to the film that started it all in the flick that, well, ended it, C-3PO's final line in the Skywalker saga was actually the same as the first one he ever uttered in the galaxy far, far away. That's right, back when 3PO and R2-D2 were first introduced on a rebel ship in the opening scene of A New Hope, the Golden Protocol droid's first words were, Did you hear that? And that's exactly the same thing Anthony Daniels' droid legend asked his longtime astromech pal on Arjun Kloss, after the Battle of Exegol, when Rey arrives back at the Resistance base in Luke Skywalker's X-Wing. Number 8, C-3PO's 42 Years line is a reference to the release of 1977's first Star Wars. When Poe Dameron, Finn, Chewbacca, Rey, BB-8 and 3PO arrive on Persana to continue Luke Skywalker's search for Exegol, the iconic protocol droid was quick to let the gang know that they had landed in the middle of the Aki Aki Festival of the Ancestors. What are the chances? He'd also reveal to the lucky group of Resistance heroes that this vibrant festival only happened once every 42 years. And you'll never guess how long it had been since the release of A New Hope at the time The Rise of Skywalker was originally in theatres. Yep, 42 years, baby! Number 7. A Star-Studded Resistance Fleet 
Just when it looked like our heroes were done for as they attempted to stop the Emperor's final order on Exegol, the mother of all reinforcements arrived to save the day. And with so many ships a staggering 14,000 strong, soaring in to assist Poe Dameron and what remained of the Resistance, it would have been pretty much impossible to spot each and every epic spaceship cameo present in this triumphant arrival during a first watch. But when you do take a second to pause the heroic entrance of the Citizen's Fleet, everything from Harrison Dula's ghost ship to Princess Leia's Tantive IV flagship to the same sort of N1 starfighter used by the likes of Anakin Skywalker and Din Djarin over the years, are all there flying into action. A hammerhead corvette first seen in the animated Rebel series, a number of Mon Calamari star cruisers just like the one Admiral Raddus flew in Rogue One, a Star Wars story, and many more familiar ships were all led into battle by the legendary Millennium Falcon too, with the shot of this fleet finally showing up absolutely overflowing with starship nostalgia. Number 6, Another Holdo Maneuver After the Resistance's victory on Exegol, thank you very much Citizen's Fleet, fans are taken back to the forest moon of Endor in a sequence showing how folks across the galaxy were rising up against the First Order. Here, the brave Ewoks are seen staring at an obliterated Star Destroyer hovering over their home. And if you take a closer look at that recently ripped in two ship from the First Order fleet, it soon becomes clear that some fearless soul opted to take a leaf out of Vice Admiral Amalyn Holdo's book in Episode 9. One eagle-eyed fan on X noticed how the white beams of light bursting out of the back of the First Order destroyer looked exactly like the ones that were left behind by the Holdo maneuver in The Last Jedi, with the Vice Admiral wrecking some enemy ships by ramming them as she jumped to hyperspace. One in a million move my ass, Finn! Number 5. Tons of Sinking Beans as Rey, Finn, Poe and the rest of the gang find themselves slowly being pulled into a sinking field on Persana, you likely weren't thinking about exactly what that black sand was actually made of. Weirdly enough though, that wasn't really sand at all. The cast were very much sinking into a collection of different materials on set, including black beans. A massive 30 tons of those little black beans were used whilst filming this impressive practical effect in the end, due to the fact they were easier to push through than actual sand. So there you go. Number 4. The Rise of the Cameos Joining the likes of the many returning cameo Jedi voices, one of the Rise of Skywalker's screenwriters, Chris Terrio, voiced the aforementioned Aftab Akbar. Warwick Davis made his Star Wars comeback as Wicket W. Warwick on the forest moon of Endor alongside his son, Harrison Davis, as Pomet. And Ed Sheeran showed up as a stormtrooper and the Resistance's Engi Golba in Episode 9. Elsewhere, Lin Manuel Miranda, who also helped create the Lido Hay song heard on Persana, shows up in the background during the Resistance's celebrations on Arjun Kloss. Mark Hamill added another Star Wars cameo to his growing list by voicing the Avician who delivers a message to our heroes early on. Clerks director Kevin Smith could be seen as a Kajimi local too. And then there was the legendary John Williams, who briefly showed up on that same planet as Oma Trez, with Abrams and his team actually surrounding the iconic composer with various props that celebrated many of the films he'd majestically scored over the years. Lovely touch. Number 3, Rey's dirty face and visor were actually CGI. While there was certainly a decent amount of outstanding practical effects visible in J.J. Abrams' second sequel trilogy flick, one particular moment involving the woman who murdered her evil grandfather on Exegol, leaving that planet actually boasted far more CGI than you likely noticed. As revealed in ILM's fascinating behind-the-scenes look at some of the magnificent digital effects used in Episode 9, Daisy Ridley surprisingly didn't have to spend a bit of time in the makeup chair having dirt applied to her face and costume, or look through a visor whilst filming her battleground exit. All of these elements were actually entirely digital, and impressively layered on top of her performance after she'd shot the cockpit moment. Number 2, Maz Kanata was an animatronic instead of CGI. From sneaky Star Wars CGI to an unexpected lack of it, Maz Kanata's return in The Rise of Skywalker was actually a whole lot more practical than her first few appearances in Episode 7 and 8. 
J.J. Abrams had actually originally wanted to go down the puppet route for Lupita Nyong'o's Pirate Queen during the making of The Force Awakens, but eventually settled on creating the character via CGI slash motion capture. However, when it came time to bring the humanoid back as Leia's advisor in Episode 9, creature and special makeup effects creative supervisor Neil Scanlon would eventually tell Cinema Blend that the director wanted the various characters sharing scenes with the late Carrie Fisher's Leia, brought to screen via digital effects and unused footage from The Force Awakens, to be quote-unquote intimately involved. So the team created a highly advanced animatronic puppet for the moment Maz could be seen interacting with the likes of Leia and Chewbacca in the flick, with digital effects only being used to perfect a few details and erase riggings. Number 1. The Callbacks to Rey's Beginnings Back when Star Wars fans first met Daisy Ridley's eventual Jedi warrior Rey on Jakku in 2015, as the nobody rummaged around the Empire's destroyed ship for parts. This involved a lot of jumping and swinging from high places, before the masked hero hopped on a piece of metal and slid down a sand dune. And as a nod to those humble beginnings, the Rise of Skywalker actually contains a few moments that act as callbacks to Rey's scavenging introduction. Take the moment Rey is searching for the Sith Wayfinder on the second Death Star. Her handy parkour skills are once again on show as she hops around another battered Empire relic. Also, as she arrives on the desert planet of Tatooine to bury her master's lightsabers, the Jakku native simply couldn't resist going for one more little sand sled ride on her way down into the Lars homestead. Rey may have ultimately become one of the most powerful Force users in the galaxy by the end of The Rise of Skywalker, but she evidently never forgot where she came from. 